You ready? Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, let me just get back to. Good morning and welcome to the City Council's ninth day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We are joined by the Committee on Governmental Operations, chaired by my colleague, Councilmember Fernando Cabrera. Uh, we're not joined yet by any of the council members, but we may be uh, shortly. Today we will hear from the Law Department, the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, the Board of Elections, and the Campaign Finance Board. Before we begin, I'd like to take, to, 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 uh, excuse me, I'd like to thank the Finance Division staff for putting today's hearing together, including the Director, Latanya McKinney, uh, Committee Councils, Rebecca Chafin, Noah Brick, and Stephanie Ruiz, Deputy Directors, Regina Parita Ryan, and Nathan Toth, Unit Head, John Russell, Financial Analyst, Sebastian Bacci, and the Finance Division Administrative Support Unit, Nicole Anderson, Maria Pagan, Latina Brown, and Courtney Summarize, who pull everything together. I'd also like to thank Robin Forst from my office for working with me on all of these hearings. Thank you for all of your efforts. I'd also like to remind everyone that the public will be invited to testify on the last day of budget hearings on May 23rd, beginning at approximately 2 p.m. in this room. For members of the public who wish to testify but cannot attend the hearings, you can email your testimony to the Finance Division at financetestimony at council.nyc.gov and the staff will make it a part of the official record. Today's executive budget hearing starts with the Law Department. The Law Department's fiscal 2020 executive budget totals $251.3 million, approximately a $15.9 million increase from the fiscal 2019 adopted budget. In the fiscal 2020 preliminary budget response, the Council called on the administration to realize personal service accruals related to the Law Department's 291, 291 vacant positions across the agency. In response, the Law Department baseline savings of $3.3 million beginning in fiscal 2020 by permanently eliminating 41 vacant positions. I look forward to learning today how the elimination of these positions will impact the essential operations of the department and how the department intends to realize additional savings in the budget. The council also called on the administration to expand vertical case handling in order to reduce the judgment and claims budget and other payouts from lost litigation settlements to order to find a savings of $4.5 million. This was not reflected in the executive budget, so I look forward to learning more on what steps the law department has taken since last year to implement vertical case handling within its divisions. Before we begin, I'd like to remind my colleagues that the first round of questions for the agency will be limited to three minutes per council member, and if council members have additional questions, we will have a second round of questions at two minutes per council member. I'll now turn the mic over to my co-chair, Council Member Cabrera, for his statement, and then we will hear from the Corporation Council, Zachary Carter. Thank you so much uh, to my co-chair, and first I want to thank you. I don't think people realize uh, that you're here literally every single day for every single hearing for the entire month of May, uh, and it is uh, it's a task, uh, and it's not an easy, easy job. So I want to commend you uh, for that. Uh, and, and you should be praised for that. So good morning, uh, everyone, and welcome to the City Council Governmental Operations Committee Fiscal 2020 Executive Budget Hearing. I am Fernando Cabrera, Chair of the Committee. Today we will hear testimony from the Law Department, the Department of City, Y Administrative Services, the Board of Elections, and the Campaign Finance Board regarding their fiscal 2019 and fiscal 2020 budget. The agencies testifying today carry out many of the most important functions that keep the city running, including managing the city-wide city vehicle fleet, defending us from lawsuits, and conducting our elections. As member of the Committee on Governmental Operation, it is our job to work with these agencies to ensure that all of this critical work gets done effectively and efficiently. In order to best do so, we look forward to hearing more detail regarding these agencies' budgets and whether or not this or not this funding is being used in the best way possible. I would like to thank our financial analyst Sebastian Palacio Bacci, committee counsel Daniel Collins, 
and policy analysts, Elizabeth Cronk and Emily Forjohn, for all their help in preparing for the hearing, as well as my own legislative director, Claire McLevain. Now I would like to please welcome Corporation Counsel Zachary Carter, the head of the law department. Thank you, Corporation Counsel, for testifying before us today. The law department fiscal 2020 executive budget totals two uh, 251 two point million, including 178 million personal services funding to support 1,910 full-time positions. New York City Law Department is responsible for all the legal affairs of the city. It represents the city, the mayor, the city council, and other elected officials, and the city's many agencies in all affirmative and defensive uh, civil litigation. The department is composed of 16 legal divisions and four support units that cover a broad array of legal matters uh, vital to the city's interests. The Family Court Division investigates juvenile delinquency matters and handles matters related to the interstate child support payments. The Tort Division, the, the Law Department's largest division, represents the city in all tort claims and the Health and Hospital Corporation and all the tort claims accept medical malpractice action. Other divisions focus on labor law, real estate lit litigation, affirmative legal actions initiated by the city, and the variety of other legal matters. At today's hearing, we would like to hear a broad update on the implementation of the first phase of Raise the Age, as well as what the department is doing to prepare for the second phase of Raise the Age, which goes into effect in October. In addition, we would like to discuss the 6.4 million uh, package the law department has included as new needs for fiscal year 2019, among other topics. With that, I pass the mic back uh, to Chair Drum. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask Council to square the panel in. Oh, before I say that, uh, we've been joined by Council Members, um, uh, by Minority Leader Steve Matteo and by Council Member Keith Powers. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Drum, uh, Chair Cabrera, and distinguished members of the Finance and Government Operations Committees. I'm pleased to appear before you to discuss the Law Department's fiscal year 2020 executive budget. Uh, as has already been observed, uh, the Law Department consists of 16 legal and five support divisions. We handle a, a, an extraordinary array of cases and non-litigation matters, from tort to tax, from employment and administrative issues to economic development and municipal finance. We also represent the city as plaintiff in a wide variety of affirmative matters. In conjunction with the Law Department's environmental law work, the executive budget contains funds to address the design of environmental, uh, the design work of environmental consultants pursuant to an order issued by the United States Environmental Protection Agency for the City of New York and 20 other entities to cooperate and participate in the cleanup of the Gowanus Canal in Brooklyn. Additionally, included in the executive budget are initial funds uh, for the NYSHA monitorship. During the first phase of implementation of Raise the Age uh, New York, in New York City, we have experienced both adjustments to the nature of our juvenile delinquency work and a gradual increase in the overall juvenile delinquency caseload. As you are aware, uh, the law raised the age of individuals subject to family court jurisdiction as juvenile delinquents to include 16-year-olds as of October 1, 2018, and to include 17-year-olds on October 1, 2019. Misdemeanor cases come directly to the family court and get referred to us by the Department of Probation if they make a determination not to adjust, that is to divert, uh, those cases. Felony cases originate in the youth part or in the evenings in criminal court arraignment before an accessible magistrate judge and may get transferred to family court. Between October 1st and December 31st, 73% of the cases were transferred to family court. Our volume is dependent on many factors, including arrest decisions, probation's adjustment rate, and the youth part transfer rate, 
all of which are affected by the rates of offenses. As part of the final stages of implementation for Raise the Age, the Office of Court Administration instituted the mandate for after-hours processing of youth who were detained upon arrest, allowing for the possibility of adjustment by the Department of Probation and access to a judge in order to review the status of their detention. Such processing requires coverage seven days a week, 365 days a year. This unanticipated new protocol was put in place in addition to the weekend and holiday court operations already existing within New York City. We are closely monitoring our evolving family court practice in preparation for phase two of Raise the Age in October. Uh, I thank you for your support of the Law Department and look forward to our continued collaboration. I would be happy to answer any of your questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Carter. Uh, let me start off with the hiring free savings. In the executive budget, the Law Department will generate baseline savings of $3.3 million beginning in fiscal 20 by permanently eliminating 41 vacant positions across the tort and family court divisions. Will this reduction have an impact on the Law Department's daily operations? Uh, we believe that we can um, manage uh, around that uh, reduction. Uh, we believe that by um, allocating those reductions in our two largest uh, bureaus in which we have uh, sufficient uh, uh, fluctuations in, in caseload over time uh, that, that, that it gives us the management flexibility that we need um, and, uh, and we, and we uh, uh, believe that that is manageable. Okay, thank you. Um, the administration set the Law Department's PEG savings target at $7.1 million. In the executive budget, you have achieved 12.1 in savings between fiscal 19 and 20, mainly from additional revenue from a one-time settlement. Can you talk about FedEx's cigarette settlement and how it's generated $8.8 .8 million uh, in additional revenue for fiscal 19? Sure. That, that was as, as a result of a um, uh, case brought by our Affirmative Litigation Division uh, uh, against uh, FedEx. Uh, and other carriers. Uh, the FedEx settlement alone uh, generated uh, the funds that you referred to uh, that, uh, that help us uh, meet our obligations uh, uh, under the PEG uh, that's been imposed. Do you anticipate receiving any other savings or any other settlements, excuse me, between now and adoption? None that are of that level, uh, of that magnitude. Uh, there will, there will, there will likely be other settlements, but nothing of that magnitude. Okay, thank you. Um, in the preliminary budget response, the council called on the administration to expand vertical case handlings in order to find a savings of $4.5 million and reduce the judgment and claims budget and other payouts through lost litigation payments. Has the law department implemented vertical case handling? Uh, yes, we have. Okay, and what type of cases are being vertically handled across the divisions? All right. The, uh, the cases uh, that are being vertically handled uh, are uh, in, uh, largely in the tort division, um, uh, in, particularly in cases involving uh, our law enforcement agencies. Um, the vertical in the context of uh, tort litigation, uh, which unfortunately uh, have cases that last uh, for many years, um, is a, it has to be a concept of team vertical, uh, where a small team of lawyers are responsible for knowing everything about every facet of the case so that you can engage in strategic planning at the very outset so that um, you can conduct the kind of investigation, make the kinds of motions, uh, engage in the kind of discovery uh, that will uh, prepare you down the line when years later the case is, is uh, prepared for, uh, for trial. Uh, because uh, the shelf life of individual tort cases um, is, may actually be uh, longer uh, than the tenure of any particular uh, a lawyer, that's the reason why a team concept of vertical is, uh, is important. And so within that concept, uh, we believe that we've achieve vertical for those cases where vertical handling is, is, is important. Are there any uh, plans to expand the portfolio of cases in the near future? That, are, that, that um, receive vertical handling? Yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, with raise the age, as a result of raise, raise the age legislation, the law department has increased the hours staff have been present at night court. Since 2016, advocates have documented a 1,736% increase of immigration and customs enforcement interactions at state courthouses, including criminal and problem-solving courts. Has the Law Department received a briefing from the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs on ICE presence in New York courts? I don't believe this. The Law Department works closely with the Mayor's Office on Immigrant Affairs, and that is something that we're watching. And of course, there's the City Council, the Administrative Code section that prohibits us from cooperating with ICE. So we're very mindful of that and work closely with Moya to, on, on those issues. Do you have policies regarding ICE and the cooperation between the Law Department and ICE? We follow both the ad code provisions and the, there is a pre-existing executive order that, that we follow. Um, our attorneys don't have much interaction with ICE, perhaps in the family court, but I, we have not heard that that's been an issue in a family court yet. Um, have you worked with Moyer to develop like an action plan should the federal law enforcement interfere with the Law Department case? Um, we haven't, but we can look into that. I, I think we'd have to think about what cases those would be. Um, okay. Um, regarding the federal monitor, the fiscal 2020 executive plan introduced 3.9 million for case-specific needs in the fiscal 2019 budget. This funding is associated with a recent federal agreement with the Law Department in which the department would cover monitoring and management consultant cost related to review of NYCHA's operations. Of the 3.9 million added in the fiscal 2019 budget, how much um, of that will be allocated to cover the cost of NYCHA's federal monitor? I believe that, I'm sorry, the, the monitor was appointed on February 28th, so he, his team will have been working for four months in this fiscal year, so the 3.9 million is expected to cover that. Um, we have not yet entered into the contract with the management consultant, so we don't quite have that firm number yet. Can you provide us at some point with a breakdown of all the costs related to the monitor? Yes, we haven't gotten uh, the budget from the monitor yet, but when we get that, that's going to be pu published on the NYCHA website. That's one of the requirements in the agreement. Oh, okay. Thank you. Has the administration commenced the contract? Oh, you said you're still in the process of contracting. Yes. Okay. And uh, how many monitors are currently covered by the department's budget, and what is the law department's role in monitoring compliance for the city? i got to count up my fingers. Yeah. Nunez. Peter Zimmer and NYCHA. That's right. There, there's four. Um, there's the NYCHA monitor we've talked about. There's the Nunez monitor for the Department of Correction. There's the Fire Department monitor. And there's the monitor, uh, Peter Zimroth, for the Police Department on the stop and frisk. There may be others in the environmental area, but I'm, I'm not clear. Can you give us some details on the various types of monitors currently being administered by the Law Department with a breakdown uh, of all related PS and OTPS costs? You want to know how much? Yes, we each can, monitor. We can, we can, we can, we can get that, that information. Yeah. Okay, good. And then um, I had some questions, which is a local issue, actually, about um, a park in my district. Uh, but let me just start off by asking you, um, I know that you are um, in the process of uh, pursuing eminent domain at the Hudson Yards. Is that correct? I'm sorry. That you're in the process of pursuing eminent domain at Hudson Yards that's, or a park? That is, that's part of the, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the process, yes. And you recognize that that's one of the wealthiest communities in Manhattan? I rec yes, I, uh, that, yeah, almost by definition, yes. Okay, do you know which, um, New York City neighborhood has the least amount of park space per resident? Personally, I do not have the answer. Okay, it happens to be Jackson Heights. And um, do you have any plans to pursue eminent domain to expand parkland in Jackson Heights? The Law Department would probably be the, the wrong uh, um, entity to ask that question. Um, we don't have the answer to that. So at this point, you do not have any plans? We can, we can uh, get you an answer to that 
question, as, as you know, and, and uh, because you have a, 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 um, an interest in uh, the expansion of the access to parkland in that area, uh, that the law department is assisting all of the actors who have an interest in coming up with uh, solutions uh, that will provide um, access to uh, to the streets that are that are adjacent to the park, particularly Seventy uh, Eighth Street, uh, that will um, likely involve uh, some compensation to private owners uh, in uh, exchange for uh, limiting their access to or eliminating their access to the the street, so it can be dedicated to uh, to uh, exclusively to pedestrian. Uh, traffic, but that's a, that's a matter that we're trying to resolve in the best interest of all the parties uh, who have an interest in that in that. Um. Okay, and you know, um, those of us who've been out there protesting and uh, uh, trying to get a you know a, a, a settlement and a solution to the issue um, feel that this is a safety issue as well. I just wanted to make you aware that we feel that the mixture of cars and kids is not a good mixture. Understood. Okay, thank you. And um, just finally to say that the Buildings Commissioner stated that curb cuts are revoked for uh, public safety reasons. He said that um, they have revoked, revoked um, uh, uh, in general for um, uh, projects that they do, but also specifically for public safety reasons that they have pulled curb cuts from um, owners. So uh, that's another aspect maybe I'd like to ask you to look into as well. Uh, uh, certainly, the, just so long as it's understood uh, that where um, private property ownership is involved, um, that um, revoking curb cuts comes with a cost, uh, because to the extent that it, uh, that um, um, monies have been expended uh, by private property owners uh, in reliance on the existence of those curb cuts. Uh, compensation uh, will likely have to be paid. Okay, and Mr. Cordo, also just in this case in particular, so you're aware, um, there is an alternative entrance to that garage, and just so you know that, um, that they could use but just don't want to use. Well, that that will be among the things that will be on the table for discussion. Okay. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Cordo. I'm going to turn it over to Chair Cabrera. <laughs> We have been joined by Council Members uh, Perkins, Rodenchik, and Yeager. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Co-Chair. Uh, let me uh, focus on race the age. Uh, the Department Executive Budget includes a lease adjustment of 1.9 million beginning in fiscal 2020 to pay for lease agreements at Gertz Plaza in Queens and one Metro Tech Center in Brooklyn for Race the Age Phase 1. Do you have sufficient space to carry out these new functions related to Race the Age? We have sufficient, we have su sufficient space in the pipeline presently, yes. Uh, how much are you paying per square feet? How many square feet are we talking about here? How much are you paying? Um, that that's been yeah, we're paying for shit. Oh, there we go. Uh, we're paying about. It depends on each site. It's a little bit different, but somewhere in, in 54 to 60 a square foot, uh, and that depends on who evaluates that. Whether it's DCAS and how they rate things, or how the landlord looks at it. Uh, what's the going price around that area? It's, it's the same. We're very competitive. Okay. And DCAS does not have property facilities that we could use? No, that's I'm always our, with all the buildings that we own in the city. That, that's always our first look with DCAS is can we get anything in space and buildings that they already have? And the Bronx is particularly uh, problematic. Uh, it's been very hard to find space there. Um, but they haven't turned anything up, and that's when we turn to, to the private. But, but DCAS and the CBRE does all the negotiation. They do the, they do the site selections with us, and uh, they do comparables as well. Okay. So I think we're getting a good deal all around. All right. We'll be talking to DCAS, uh, the next panel. Uh, in terms of, let me switch to uh, Nisha, the Executive 
plan includes a 3.9 million in fiscal 2019 to cover uh, monitoring and management consultants costs related to a review of national operations, but nobody knows how much uh, how much staff uh, the monitor is hiring. Nobody knows whether his budget cap at a certain amount. Can you provide this information to us? The the monitor's budget. Man, the monitor's supposed to give us has to give us an annual budget, um, and then it is subject to the comment and approval of the city, the SDNY, and HUD. If there's disagreement, the HUD secretary decides. So we're still waiting for them to give us that first annual budget, and then we will get together and try but, to. So when you're anticipating getting this, because I mean, we're at the tail end, I mean, how do, you, how do you budget for for this and we're going to be passing this budget just literally in a few weeks? I call them literally every other day or email and saying, look, we're in the budget, and we're in the tail end of the budget cycle. If you don't give it to us, I'm not going to be able to pay you. Okay. <laughs> um, so I don't know that they believe me, but the, that is, that's the discussion, and I do expect that we'll get it very soon because. What are you, what are you going to do if they don't do that by, let's say, June 7? I don't know. Don't know. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, that would be. Uh, is there a cap? Uh, uh, is there is there no cap in the agreement. It's supposed to be reasonable costs, and the fact that they have to post it on the NYCHA website was intended to try to get them to be reasonable because uh, the, all the public will know what they're charging. Okay, and uh, my last question is and just curious. To, you know, uh, the, the law department has the purview of representing people and possibly in the council. Are you representing anybody in the council at all? Currently? I Currently. I was just curious. I think I think there's two cases where we are representing the council or if not, they recently ended. Um, we have represented council members in, in litigation. Okay. And at depositions. When is, is this related to an elected official or staff? Elected. Elected officials. Okay. Thank you so much. I, I know we have our colleagues and we have literally 15 minutes uh, before the next. We want to stay on schedule. Okay. We've been joined by council member Adams and now we have questions from council member Powers. Thank you. Nice to see you. Um, I just, I'm looking through the budget and I noticed a, uh, a revenue stream called sale of streets in your revenue. Can you uh, give us some information on what that refers to? I mean, it sounds like literally a literal, def but can you tell us more about what, how that works and where the revenue derives from? Is that part of the demapping process? Part of the demapping process. So, if a building is going to use a plaza, uh, I, I believe what we do is sell it, then the land after what, all of the review uh, before we do anything with streets. So, how many streets were sold in the last fiscal year? Uh, we'd have to look and let. We you can know. provide you that information. Okay. Um, and what's the and what? How was the pro? I've just never I've never heard of this. So, what is the process for how a sale is initiated and how the, how does that process work? I'm sorry, that's really not my area, so I will have to get that outlined for you and send it to you later. Okay, and is there another agency that's involved in this? I'm sure there are multiple agencies involved, probably planning and, and DOT. Okay, and then I just noticed in your budget you have 275, $275,000 for the next two fiscal years planned in terms of sales of streets. Can you tell us where that number comes from? Or is it just a, is it? Um, that is, is just a, over time a baseline budget with, um, with OMB. Okay. I'd be interested just to know more information about that in terms of, I mean, it is technically city streets that I think we're, we're, we're demapping and selling off and whether we're getting the right value for it, but also what the process is. I'm sure city planning and borough presidents and other people are involved in that, but I just noticed it in your budget, so I wanted to just ask a couple questions about it. If you can send any follow-up information you have on it, that'd be helpful. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. So uh, just a few more follow-up questions. Um, the current year fiscal, uh, the current fiscal year judgment and claims budget. The judgment and claims budget for fiscal 19 is 697 million, which is lower than the actual judgment and claims spending um, annual, annual average of 722.5 million over the past five years. Can you explain why the JNC budget is relatively small in the current fiscal year? Part of it is, as, as we've um, explained in, in prior budget cycles, um, is the um, unpredictability of when um, major cases are resolved. Uh, as I was talking about earlier with respect to, to vertical, uh, these uh, cases have a very long shelf life and there are lots of factors that go into whether or not uh, a case will be settled and what the timeline for it is. Uh, I'd like, I believe that uh, a lot of the reduction is attributable uh, to uh, approaches that we've taken to litigation that include uh, vertical handling, uh, that, um, that include um, um, an uh, aggressive position that we've taken in um, uh, bringing, uh, uh, taking to trial cases that we believe uh, are lacking in merit. Uh, particularly in cases involving uh, our law enforcement agencies um, so that um, the legal community is signaled that uh, there's no easy payday uh, that comes from uh, bringing uh, uh, frivolous cases and expecting the city to, uh, to settle them for nuisance value. Uh, we would prefer to take those cases to trial and we believe that over time it will discourage uh, some of the firms that we uh, fondly refer to as frequent flyers uh, from, uh, from bringing uh, s uh, frivolous actions. Mm -hmm. Was one of the cases the Central Park Five? I'm sorry? Was one of the cases over that period the Central Park Five case that was finally settled no, under that, the Blasio that was, administration? That was, that was settled several years ago. Double, that, would oh, okay. not be, that would not be included in this. Uh, that okay. Do you expect it to expand by the time of the adopted budget? You expect the, the plan to expand, that the amount will expand uh, by the time of the adopted budget? I don't believe so. Okay. Um, the law department generates uh, miscellaneous revenue through the sale of streets or demapped small non-functional city roads. How are such sales uh, initiated? And does the law department approach potential buyers or do prospective buyers approach the law department? I have to say that, that uh, in terms of our representation here today, that's not an area of my, of my specialty. Um, and uh, we'll, we will uh, uh, get you uh, uh, the, that information since that's been a, 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 a matter of interest uh, for you and, and, and at least one other council member. And how, do you, um, how does the Law Department budget for federal impact litigation? We don't um, have a budget line for uh, federal impact uh, litigation aside from what we budget for affirmative litigation generally. Um, that, that, uh, and what, what's budgeted for affirmative litigation uh, is at least currently adequate uh, to, uh, uh, to support um, uh, litigation that involves uh, the federal government. Okay. So um, why is affirmative litigation revenue much higher in fiscal 19 than in previous years? You mean the revenues? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. I think it, it was the, uh, the settlement of, uh, I'm sorry, the, the recoveries from uh, the trials uh, against uh, the uh, national carriers uh, in the cigarette litigation, the uh, the, uh, the for the the, the uh, unlawful transport of, uh, of untaxed cigarettes, those were those were uh, very large settlements. And do you expect any um, increase in affirmative litigation revenue in fiscal 2020? I don't. I'm not anticipating any. Um, very large settlement. I, I don't. I expect that uh, that uh, that uh, the settle the, the settlement numbers will probably be level. Okay. All right. You have a question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. No. Yeah. 
Excellent. Uh, this is in related to a, uh, early voting as a government, at a government operations uh, committee hearing in April. Uh, the city BOE said that designating private sites as early voting polling places is complicated because the law department has not authorized a short-term leasing process. Can you first confirm that this is a concern for the law department? Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. Really? That's going to be interesting in the next BOE panel we're going to have. So there is no concern. There is, do they have to go through the law department in order to have this there, short term? There, there is um, almost certainly a process uh, for um, uh, identifying sites, uh, entering into leases where that, uh, where that is uh, uh, necessary. Um, have they approached you about this? It has not come to my personal attention that there's been any delay or undue delay okay. uh, because of any uh, work that has to be done by the law. But have they said, hey, we, we're interested in having sh short-term leases uh, and we need your advice and your blessing alongside with, with DCAS? It is possible uh, that BOE has consulted with the appropriate divisions at the law department on this issue. But, but no problem in terms of delay has been brought to my personal attention. Okay. But at this moment, is any of your staff that is here aware that they have literally approached you? No? Okay. I really appreciate that answer. Sure. It's a good answer. Thank you so much. Hey, uh, that's it. Getting off easy today. <laughs> we thank you for coming in, and uh, we will see you hopefully soon. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, we will now resume with the City Council's hearing on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. The Finance Committee is joined by the Committee on Governmental Operations, chaired by Councilmember Fernando Cabrera. We have been joined by Councilmember Adrian Adams, Councilmember Barry Gredenchik, Councilmember Bill Perkins, and others, I think, uh, Councilmember Keith Powers just walked in, and others will probably join us in a bit. We have just heard from the Law Department, and now we will hear from the Commissioner of the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, Lizette Camillo. In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement, but before we hear testimony, I will open the mic to my co-chair, Councilmember Cabrera. Thank you, uh, co-chair, and I would like to welcome Lizette Camillo, the Commissioner of the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. Thank you, Commissioner, for testifying before us today. DCAS 2020 Executive Budget totals $1.25 including $211 0.2 million in service and personal services for fu funding to support 2,534 full-time positions, 738.3 million, or approximately 61 percent of DCAS budget is allocated for the citywide heat, light, and power bill. This is the city's utility bill, which DCAS manages and pays for all other city agencies through its emergency management. Division, DCAS, has a diverse mission that impacts almost all aspects of the city's operation. It is the city's real estate manager, leasing private space for city agencies and leasing city-owned space to private entities. It manages a fleet of 31,000 vehicles, the largest municipal fleet in the nation. It administers exams to aspiring civil service employees and manages goods and services procurement through the Office of Citywide Purchasing. Today, we look forward to discussing many aspects of DCAS operations, including the agency's efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from city buildings, the state of the city-wide electric vehicle fleet, and the lack of funding for the public uh, non-public security guard program as of the release of the fiscal 2020 executive budget, among other important topics. And with that, I'll turn it back to my co-chair. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask counsel to swear the panel in. Do you firm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. I Thank do. you. You may proceed. Ready? You can start, Commissioner. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Chairs uh, Cabrera and Drum, and members of the Committee on Finance and Governmental Operations. I'm Lisa Camilo, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Administrative Services. At DCAS, we provide value-added and effective shared services to support the operations of city government. We approach our work with a commitment to three core values, equity, effectiveness, and sustainability. Equity, ensuring that city government leads the way by having a diverse and inclusive workplace and providing all New Yorkers with an opportunity to get ahead. Effectiveness, leveraging our expertise to connect customers with the resources and services they need. And sustainability, mobilizing our resources to problem solve at scale to support the New York City of tomorrow. I'm pleased here to discuss the proposed DCAS budget for fiscal year 2020. When I was last year in March for our preliminary budget testimony, I discussed some of the great work that is happening at DCAS. This includes expanding civil service exam testing centers to each of the five boroughs, increasing contract awards to MWBEs by 26% between FY17 and FY18, deploying sexual harassment prevention training to over 355,000 people in under one year, reducing the number of provisional employees in city government to an all-time low of 15,801. While I am very proud of this success, today I'd like to focus on some of our agency's priorities for the upcoming fiscal year. To put our budget in perspective, it's important to understand that the majority of DCAS's expenses cover utility costs for city agencies. Out of our $1.3 billion budget, $739 million is allocated for heat, light, and power. These are fixed costs based on forecasted energy usage and utility rates. The good news is that DCAS has helped city agencies become more energy efficient and is generating an all-time high amount of green energy on city properties. The second largest expense is the salaries of at over 2,500 employees. 
These are the highly skilled and dedicated men and women who make sure we can adequately support government operations. In addition to these expenses, DCAS performs a wide range of functions that impact the lives of all New Yorkers. Of, of all of this work, there is perhaps no greater challenge we are confronting than fighting climate change. At a time when Washington is turning its back on climate change, the city is committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Recently, Mayor de Blasio announced the New York City Green New Deal. Under this plan, the city will accelerate its emissions reduction targets. This includes a new goal of reducing all greenhouse gas emissions in New York City 40% by 2030 and achieving full carbon neutrality by 2050. To help us get there, DCAS is taking action. Thanks to the leadership of this council, legislation that was passed and signed into law earlier this year paves the way for us to reduce emissions from city government operations 40% by 2025 and 50% by 2030. This work includes expanding our efforts to improve energy efficiency in city buildings and infrastructure, transforming our municipal vehicle fleet by reducing its size and using the greenest fueling options available, and pursuing a deal to power 100% of city operations with clean electricity sources such as hydropower. Reaching these new, more aggressive goals requires making investments. Under this budget, DCAS received $59 million to expand our efforts to identify additional viable energy efficiency projects and to bring them to fruition. This funding will allow us to add 34 new staff members at DCAS, expand our agency energy personnel program to place energy management staff at other agencies, audit energy use and install real-time metering of energy consumption in city facilities, and improve operations and maintenance practices, among other measures. The new DCAS staff members will focus on the delivery of energy efficiency retrofit projects at partner agencies. They will undertake strategic planning, oversee project budgeting and contracting, track and analyze data, and something that will be music to your ears, they will pursue available financial incentives for project delivery. This fiscal year, we will also flight climate change by building upon our success, creating the cleanest and greenest municipal vehicle fleet in the country. After a successful demonstration period over the last fiscal year, we will finalize a contract to make renewable diesel a fixture in our fleet. Renewable diesel is a game changer. Diesel fuel is one of the dirtiest fuels and now we'll have a cleaner alternative. In contrast to traditional diesel, renewable diesel is 99% petroleum free and reduces carbon emissions 60%. In addition to our work on sustainability, DCAS has an important role in developing training programs for all city employees. In this year's expense budget, we received $500,000 that will be used to purchase the required software and engage consultants to develop a learning management system to expand e-learning capabilities. This is in addition to the $1.5 million in our capital budget allocated for systems integration and $100,000 for up, upfront setup costs. There are many advantages to administering employee training via e-learning, including decreasing the length of time to create training courses, increasing productivity by having participants take training classes at their work locations rather than going off-site, and allowing mandatory training to be offered in a much more efficient and cost-effective manner. During the upcoming fiscal year, we will also invest in the city workforce by taking new steps to reduce the wait times between administration of civil service exams and the publishing of lists. For civil service exams that are education and experience based, we will roll out a system where exams are automatically rated as candidates answer questions. After exams are completed, Candidates will receive a tentative result, an explanation of the result, and a way to submit an appeal if they would like to contest their score. This fiscal year, we will also make new investments in cybersecurity. Executive Order 28 was issued by the mayor to meet one of the major challenges that all organizations now face, which is the safeguarding of IT systems and operations. DCAS received $600,000 to help in this effort. This funding will be used to purchase necessary software and tools that will be used to detect and help prevent any viruses and threats from infiltrating and harming our IT systems. 
While we are making new investments, DCAS has also identified budget reduction initiatives, as requested by OMB, that will not adversely affect the agency's delivery of core services. These initiatives include identifying savings from city government's heat, light, and power bills. The work we are doing to improve energy efficiency in city buildings and infrastructure has already resulted in $800,000 in baseline savings beginning in, a, in FY20. DCAS is also working with various agencies to reduce energy consumption via the Energy Load Management Program. We assess agencies' energy consumption and identify operations that can be transferred from periods of peak energy demand when energy costs are highest to off-peak times when energy costs are lower. We will also save money through the current hiring freeze. DCAS will eliminate six vacant positions in FY20, resulting in $400,000 in savings. The agency will implement this reduction in areas that will create the least adverse impact to agency operations. DCAS also anticipates earning an additional $1.2 million in FY20 through our auto surplus auctions. Mayor de Blasio recently signed Executive Order 41 to reduce the size of the city's vehicle fleet. We will eliminate at least 1,000 vehicles, leaving us with more vehicles we can put up for auction. In terms of generating revenue, the FY20 budget is $65.4 million, primarily due to three factors. One, a projected $43.1 million in private rentals of city-owned property, DCAS's largest source of recurring revenue. Two, $10.1 million for the sale of surplus vehicles and other city-owned equipment. And three, $3.8 million from applicant filing fees for civil service exams. For our capital plan, the executive budget reflects an updated four-year plan of $2.8 billion from FY20 through FY23. This plan includes maintenance and enhancement to DCAS facilities, obtaining leased spaces, and continuing our energy conservation work. The executive capital budget for FY20 is $772 million and will allow us to complete a few core initiatives. DCAS's capital construction program for city-owned court and non-court buildings total $376 million in FY20. While this includes the routine operations and maintenance of our buildings, it is also a part of a broader focus on helping agencies more efficiently use office space in our municipal buildings. The capital plan for FY20 includes $284.5 million for energy efficiency and clean energy projects. It features $10.8 million and allocated to install 500 fast electric vehicle chargers. These chargers will speed up the charging process, keeping fleet vehicles on the streets serving New Yorkers and not docked at an outlet. It also includes $17.4 million allocated to renovate leased office space to support the Raise the Age initiative. DCAS has a clear vision for how it will continue to provide effective shared services to support the operations of city government. Under the leadership of Mayor Bill de Blasio and with the dedication of our entire DCAS team, we have made enormous strides in advancing our mission and doing so with a clear focus on equity, effectiveness, and sustainability. But you are vital partners in this work. As the elected leaders of communities across our city, the Council has an important role to play in making sure we are responsive to the needs of our constituents. We always welcome your ideas, your feedback, and your support. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Let me start off with uh, some talk about the hiring free savings. In the preliminary budget response, the Council called on the administration to implement a partial hiring freeze of 50 positions in DCAS. Asset and, the asset management and, and the Asset Management Division in order to generate um, personnel savings. Uh, in response to the Council's call, DCAS has eliminated six vacant positions across the agency to realize a total savings of $395,000 in fiscal 20 and $431,000 in 21. Uh, why were only six vacant uh, positions eliminated in the, in the executive budget if the agency has 83 city-funded vacancies as of March? Okay. Well, the, the reduction that you're seeing was implemented by OMB. We did not offer that as one of our saving programs related to the PEG. Um, my understanding is that OMB um, 
that this type of peg impacted all the agencies, or most agencies across the city. Um, when they did their calculation of uh, the six positions for DCAS, they exempt facilities management, which is our largest component of headcount in this agency. Also, they excluded energy management from the reduction due to the, the mandates that they have in, uh, in, in climate change for the city of New York. Um, the 3 percent, it's the, the reduction re represents 0.3 percent of our total headcount, but again, city funded headcount, but those two exclusions of energy management and facilities, which is again the largest portion of DCAS's headcount, resulted in this, uh, in this calculation of six positions. So do you intend to uh, fill those positions? Not which positions? The, the management positions that you're talking about? Uh, facilities management. management. Yes, I mean facilities management, as you would, uh, you may know, uh, deals with the life and safety of all of our employees in both uh, public buildings and, and court facilities, and uh, with that comes uh, the largest component, um, uh, custodians that ensure that the our spaces are clean. Um, then we have our stationary engineers and, and boiler plant uh, individuals, our trades titles. So, um, it, you know, it's a vital core function of this agency. And therefore, yes, we, we expect to always fill our facilities headcount. And can you let us know um, what those six vacant positions are going to be? Absolutely. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, uh, just talk a little bit about uh, the non-public school security reimbursement program. In the preliminary budget response, the council called on the administration to add additional funding to reach 19.8 million for the non-public school security reimbursement program, a program that reimburses qualifying non-public schools for the cost of on-site security services. Although the current fiscal year contains $14 million for private security reimbursements, there is no funding for this program in fiscal uh, 2020 as of the release of the fiscal 2020 executive budget. Can you explain DCAS's role in the administration of the non-public school security reimbursement program? Sure. I mean, I'll kick it off. Uh, we have been working with OMB and we put in a request for funding of the program and those discussions are ongoing, uh, but we are the agency tasked with managing the program from its inception. Uh, so we had, cre we created the, the rules that support the program, developed the application process, the uh, memorandums of understandings uh, within each school. Um, and we've done that for the past several years. We work with each agency to establish a yearly budget for each participating school, uh, and then work with them to process, to intake process and pay out invoices at, throughout the year in order to reimburse for the expenditures. How many non-public schools are currently reimbursed uh, for the security services under this program? 163. 163? And what is your estimate of the number of schools that could be eligible under this program? Um, the, the, when the law, when the bill was being analyzed, um, it estimated that there's about 300 non, uh, uh, non uh, ed, uh, Board of Education, Department of Education schools that can participate. Um, you know, we depend on the New York State Education Department to tell us who has what they call a BEDS number, uh, because the BEDS number is the indicator um, that represents how many students are in a particular school. Um, but that is, uh, you know, the number one indicator is the BEDS. Um, we just finished uh, the filing period, just closed uh, May 15th for the school year 2019 slash 2020. <coughs> We received an additional 42 applications. Um, so therefore, you know, we're evaluating those applications. And uh, for those schools that we see there's an issue with the application, we're getting back to them within five to 10 business days and having that dialogue. For those schools that their application has been completed correctly, they will receive notification no more than 30 business days that their application has been accepted. 
Now, from the point of application acceptance, there's another process that has to take place, and that process cannot begin until they certify their beds number with the New York State Education Department, which can happen to the first Wednesday of October. And once they self-certify their beds number with the New York State Education Department, they provide that information to us, and that kicks off the secondary portion of this, this process, which is if they have to have an MOU because they're a new school, they have to, uh, we have to develop the MOU, they have the template and, and our assistance in doing that, and ultimately, you know, at some point, obviously, when the MOU is assigned by all parties, that we have to go for registration with the controller's office. Um, during the course of this application period, we held five informational um, uh, s uh, sessions, invited all the, uh, the schools who are eligible for this program uh, to, to attend. Um, 69 schools participated in this program, in, in this informational uh, session. So uh, we, we ensured that uh, there was always a reach, uh, outreach. Um, there was multiple notifications sent to all schools about the, the filing period being opened. Uh, for, for those that had not sent their application in and were participating in the program, multiple communications. So my understanding is that all the schools that have participated in the program that um, needed to be uh, uh, apply within the application process did, and like I said, 42 new schools have applied for the program. So if everyone is accepted in totality, we should have 205 participating schools. So um, be, uh, before last year, did any schools drop out of the program? Um, they may have been maybe a couple schools who were uh, approved and we never heard back from them. Um, that, that does happen, I don't know the specifics, but I know that in the past there's been a couple of schools that apply and for whatever reason um, don't come forward with the required uh, self-certification of their BEDS number or um, you know, the completion of the MOU. And the BEDS number is important because you have to have 300 or more students, right? Correct. And it's the also eligible. required in the legislation mm -hmm. to, that establishes the threshold. Okay, can you provide us with a list of the schools that are being reimbursed for fiscal 19? Absolutely. Okay, um, and what is the process for a security guard company to become qualified under the program? So we have a pre-qualified list. Um, we did outreach in that pretty much every year. Um, it, uh, security guard companies can come in, they have to submit um, a number of um, documents in order to demonstrate their ability to perform the services. Um, we do um, a, a number of outreach events as well to inform the security uh, vendors um, of what it takes to work or to participate in the program. We do our due diligence um, and if they pass through that, uh, they make it onto the pre-qualified list. Um, and then the schools are able to utilize anyone that was approved, any, any vendor uh, that was approved uh, and located on this list. Do you know the uh, number of incidents in fiscal 19 uh, that have, have been reported to DCAS that involve criminal activity or other significant incidents? So we, uh, between 2016 and 2018, a total of 65 incidents had been reported um, when there have been about 49 that had um, been referred to the NYPD and about two uh, that required EMS. Okay, and can, can you tell us uh, what those incidents were? Do you have those details? Um, they're not required <laughs> to give us any information um, in terms of the, the documents that were reported by the NYPD for the incident. Um, that's, it's not required. Um, it's only required for them to report any incident that may have occurred, may have occurred and uh, you know we we request that in October, at, um, following the school year's closure, um, and it, there is no requirement other than you know that you have any um, incidents reported. No, then that's fine. If you had, how many um, were they referred to the NYPD, and we collect that data and just have it on file. Okay. 
Um, in the preliminary budget response, the council called on the administration to include an indicator in the MMR, uh, PMMR in order to track the progress of the 80 by 50 initiative. Uh, will you agree to include this indicator in the release of the next MMR, PMMR? So the 80 by 50 um, goal it, uh, spans across multiple agencies. It's not just DCAS. So if there's been discussions at a, from, a, from a larger perspective, from a city perspective, um, we haven't been a part of those discussions. We're happy to, to be a part of those discussions. Um, you haven't been a part of them, or you have been? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear it. For the larger discussions on whether or not to include PMMR indicators about the 80 by 50 um, process, we have not. I have not been directly involved in those discussions, but we're happy to have them or okay. be a part of them. All right. Thank you. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to my co-chair uh, to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, how many, when do the, um, the non-public schools, uh, when do they get reimbursed? Do they, they get reimbursed is there a schedule? On a, as, as invoices come in, we will pay those invoices. So it's a ro on a rolling basis throughout the year. And uh, what's from the point that they submit it mm -hmm. to the point they get their reimbursement, how long is usually that process? Um, after we receive the invoice and if everything checks in terms of the invoice or the proper documentation, which, you know, it's, they have to show that they actually pay the security guard to, you know, a EFT um, transaction or actual check, um, it should be no more than 30 days after really? receiving I, it. So I'm, I'm going to, we'll, we'll talk offline. I had, I was in an event, literally out of my district, and uh, someone, actually it was a, a priest who told me that uh, they had not gotten reimbursed, and I was a bit surprised, so. Um, yeah, we, 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 we have, okay. you know, we're always available. We, we always notify schools if there are issues promptly. Um, you know, we're more than happy to have them come to our office and sit down and we can, you know, Rather than emails, phone conversations, pinpoint where the issues are. Um, there's, uh, you know, uh, 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 you just will talk offline. Okay. We'll absolutely assist them in, in getting them Fantastic. paid because that's that's it's, for all of us. It's very important. Okay. I think part of the challenge is making sure that an invoice has the, all of the supporting documentations. Um, and I think that's where some of the delay might come in, where we where we require certain pieces of paper that they might not have. Okay. that they might have missed, or that adds to the, to the delay. But like Rich said, we're happy to, to sit down and walk them through what's necessary. But I'm happy to hear it's just one month, because, yeah. you know, for a lot of these yeah. non-public schools, for them, it you know, it's a, it's a heavy problem. lift. So you know, they may not obviously have a surplus to deal with a, a, a month's invoice not coming in in terms of payment. So Absolutely. Uh, uh, question, how, many, how much space do we have uh, in terms of uh, city-owned property, how much space do we have available? It depends on what you, how you, how you ask that question. Let's so, the DCAS manages 55 buildings, half of which are for courts. Other agencies have their own building stock that they would manage. We don't have line of sight into other agencies' um, space. Um, that said, we've started uh, a project um, related to the Space Savings Initiative to measure and map out, starting with our, our buildings. Um, and we've completed, I believe, two buildings from top to bottom, measuring those. Um, but notwithstanding, uh, for our office space, I'm working off dusty memory, I believe we have about 13 million square feet of DCAS-owned uh, space, non-court facilities. And how much of that is free? I'm sorry? How much is that available at this moment to be used? We don't have that uh, total. There's not much uh, availability across our building portfolio. 
um, that's vacant. The, the places where we do have, you know, nooks and crannies uh, here and there, we, we've tried to fill out. For example, 20, the building, one of the buildings that we have that was recently up until a few years ago was almost vacant, 22 Reed, um, over the past couple of years, we have completely filled it up given the, the needs of other city agencies. Um, so, you know, where we, where we do have vacant space that can accommodate uh, more than, you know, a couple of cubicles here and there, we definitely repurpose. So the $43 million that we are able to collect every year in terms of rental from city-owned building, what type of buildings do you have a breakdown of? We can provide that for you. Yeah. But, but do you have like an average that you could give us right now? There are businesses uh, that operate on some of our properties. Um, so, you know, the, the, well, I'll turn it over to Laura who can talk more about that. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. So for those 43 million, it's, a, it's a mostly short-term leases. We have about 350 and we have 80 long-term leases. So some of those are ground. Carnegie Hall, for example, um, but the, of the 350 short term, most of those are small lots. Some are small buildings, but the majority are lots that are leased for purposes like ancillary parking or parking to businesses or other community needs. Um, but if you want a more detailed list, yeah, we can provide. Please state your name for the record and just swear oh, you in. Point. If you could give us your name for the record. Laura Ringelheim. Do you firm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Thank you. The reason I'm asking is because we just had the law department uh, here, and we're spending quite a bit of money for the race day age. And I'm just wondering, is it more cost effective for us to use our own building rather than to lease from, you know, very expensive space uh, and why, why are we leasing while we could use our own buildings? Sure. So we, we're looking at that portfolio, and when we decide to lease out to a private tenant to use our space, it's not space that the city has any use for. So, for example, very small lots that might go to a business for parking that the city can't use otherwise for parking, like police parking. Um, then we do an analysis of space such as some of the, the retail spaces. And if the city has a retail space need, which is generally more expensive than an office space, we can actually make more money from leasing to the private sector and paying. It will, it will net effective more revenue for the city than the cost. But certainly, if we come across space that's being leased to someone else, we have uh, on occasion now started to take any of those spaces back. So some are not-for-profits that do work on behalf of the city, Safe Horizons for example, but for other ones where the city can use that space, we absolutely are going to look, look with an eye for everything of what we can use. But the majority of the ones that we have talked about are either very old long-term leases where the businesses have uh, leases you know, that were done in the 60s, 70s, and 80s and they go for quite some time. But for the ones that come up regularly, we definitely look at those and and are not intending to lease any space the city can use to private sector. Do you have an average uh, number that you could give us on how much we're making per square feet? For each lease? Yeah, that for, we send for out? the lease. So it widely varies because it's based on borough and use and zoning. But average, can you give us an average citywide? Probably not an average. We can probably be more specific by looking at each lease. Um, some of the old long-term ground leases might be a few dollars per square foot, and some of the retail locations are gonna be market value, so $150 per square foot. So gotcha. to average it wouldn't, I don't think, give you an accurate reflection. Uh, let me uh, move to uh, the census. Uh, we have five positions uh, that, uh, are $490,000 that we're gonna baseline. Why are we baselining these positions when pretty much in a year we're not going to have those positions anymore, I assume? That's a very good question, <laughs> which I don't have an answer for. I think that this would be better suited for OMB to answer. Um, we are definitely assisting census in um, hiring uh, those five uh, uh, 
lines, but ultimately they're being managed um, by some, by I think De Deputy Mayor uh, Phil Thompson's team um, in terms of the day-to-day -day operations of that project. So you'll get back to us in terms, once you speak with them? For, I think that we can, we can totally facilitate I'm, an OMB uh, conversation for sure. Yeah, I mean, it just from this end, it doesn't make sense why. I'm sure from your end as Fair well. question. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Um, I have two more questions, but let me, let me give them to them and I'll come back. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have been joined by Councilmember Rosenthal who has questions. Thank you so much, Chairs, and thank you, Commissioners. Great to see you here again. Appreciate all the good work you and your staff do for DCAS. I wanted to touch on three points. Um, let's start with, um, in your testimony, page five, you talk about renewable diesel. And then on page, um, I think it's on page eight, you talk about uh, the, the, charge, the electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. it, do you have an opinion about which is better, which you should be, the city should be investing it in, renewable diesel or electric? So we need all the tools that we can get. So there are gonna, there's a lot, there are a lot of equipment and vehicles, particularly the heavy duty, uh, larger vehicles that have typically run on diesel that don't have the technology to, to run on electricity as of yet. So we need cleaner fuels in order to make sure that those vehicles operate. Um, what we also do believe that you know we have to get the cleanest fuel available, and we're actually really excited to roll out the renewable diesel on a on a broader scale than just the pilot that we that we successfully completed last year. Um, on the electric vehicles, for any um, vehicle where we can go electric, we want to push that as much as possible. And in fact, yesterday we announced, um, uh, made an announcement that we're going to double the citywide goal from 2,000 to 4,000 by 2025. So we're really pushing on all levels. Did I miss anything, Keith? Uh, could you provide to the council just a list of the vehicles that are appropriate for the renewable diesel and how many you're there and what your projections are? And same with electric. We can just we can do that. How many you have and, and what your projections are for getting there, how many you need to, to change over to get to your goal for both the renewable diesel and for the electric. Okay, thanks. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, the, uh, the school guards. Mm -hmm. Are there any criteria around need. In other words, um, it's my understanding there are a number of schools that are taking advantage of mm -hmm. this opportunity for reimbursement that had always had security guards mm -hmm. uh, historically, but are now using tax levy to cover the cost that was privately paid for before. Do you have a sense of how many schools are in that situation or, and also whether or not there's a criteria for need? So we, the, the, the program. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Just the, two, this one, then one more. The program that we're implementing, we're basing on the legislation that created yeah. the, the program. And the only requirements that the law included was the, the, bid, the beds number as well as the, the, the basic level of students that um, the program needed to have, um, or the school needed to, to have enrolled in order to the qualify 300. for the, right, in order to qualify for the security services. So we're following the policy yep. set forth by the yep. legislature. Now, if you look at the participants, you, you do see schools that have, um, that charge a significant amount of tuition, but the, the, the law that created the, the program didn't um, account for any other factors in order to um, qualify for the program. Sure. My concern is that there are so many schools that really need, um, well, let me ask it a different way. Of the number of incidents that you reported, uh, the 49, the 2, the 65, 65 mm -hmm. do, did any of them occur 
around these schools that that really I do not have that information offhand, but we can certainly check and get back to you. Yeah, I'd be interested to sure. know that. And then, um, do you have any information on um, whether or not the demand for um, the security guards outweighs the supply? Because if I remember right, there's a cap on how much money can be allocated for this. Uh, we have not um, seen an overwhelming um, demand for this program. Okay. We, we process the invoices as we get them. Sure, sure. Do you have an idea of how much money that we're putting into schools that otherwise would have the security services had them before? We don't collect that information in terms of did you no, have... No. Oh. I'm saying, you know, you, you mentioned that you know that there are schools that... Yeah, sure. A few, maybe five. At least that I've, I'm aware of. There could be others that I don't know. One in particular that I'm aware of collects over a million dollars a year from this fund um, and uh, has an endowment of over $60 million. Um, and... Uh, you know, the, the income level, if we looked at AMI of the school, um, I don't think we'd see tremendous poverty. Do you think there would be, um, what are your thoughts about that? Could you come back to us with how much money is being spent of taxpayer dollars on schools that could otherwise pay for it that, that maybe even are secular? Schools. We can certainly provide you the list of schools that are participating. I don't know. I don't know what measures or criteria that we would use to call those schools out, but we can certainly share with you the list of schools that are participating. And I think you can make your Great. own Thank you. decisions. Thank you. And then, lastly, I just want to ask about the burden to DCAS of collecting the information on sexual harassment training and the other work around that. So, if I'm recalling correctly, off the top of my head. Um, you've produced the report on how many people, which agencies have done the training, is that right? Yes, and if, which, yes. And the number of people participated at each. That one came out in maybe January? I believe so, yes. Okay, um, and then you have the climate survey one, mm -hmm. and then you have the number of complaints Correct. for each agency. How's it going at DCAS for collecting that information? Do you feel you have good systems in place in order to do that work? So it has definitely been a Herculean effort by the team. Uh, we had to implement that incredibly quickly. And as you can imagine, um, ha managing you know, 50 mayoral and another 40 non-mayoral uh, entities to try and get collect information in a streamlined way um, set up a co um, computer-based training uh, and deploy them across the city. Um, First also, year is always tough. I'm sorry? First year, always a challenge. Tough, but we, we also were working with a system that is pretty much at the end of its lifespan. So, um, not, so the IT portion was a lift, but the people portion was certainly a lift. We worked intensely closely with all city agencies um, to really push m and make sure that everyone was trained. Uh, yes, it was very difficult. Um, however, you know, at the beginning of last year, we definitely received some resources uh, to, to aid in this project. Um, and you know we're we're building up that team currently and expanding it um, on all issues of EEO. So sexual harassment prevention training was the big one that we did this year, but we're working on expanding other um, EEO trainings as well. Part of my testimony, I highlighted that we also got uh, some funds to upgrade our IT system in order to make the development of additional trainings. Um, easier um, so that we can add more to our library, um, but also the learning management portion of it uh, for it to be an easier lift in order to track all of the completions because yep. that's, that, that was actually the biggest challenge for us is to try and corral all of the information across almost 100 different entities. So when you report, and I just haven't seen the report on trainings, so I'm doing this off the top of my head, my apologies, but when you report on trainings, it's all mayoral and non-mayoral. 
I can't remember exactly, but we are training, we, we certainly are training mayoral and non-mayoral. I can't remember if the report, which actually, I'm working off of memory and I forgive me, but I believe the first report for the training is actually next January that's due. Because oh, the, the, so because we the law seen it yet. Because Thank the you. law because the law went into effect. Yes, I believe that's the case. But don't the sponsor is oh. agreeing with you. Oh well, I'm glad that my memory is working. <laughs> um, so oh good. It'll show that everyone the number of people who've been trained at every agency I, and what I mayoral and non mayoral. I can't remember that distinction. We certainly are training non mayorals. I can't recall if the if the legislation requires reporting on the non mayorals, but we are keeping track of that anyway. And do you keep track of the number of people who are employees and the number of people who are trained? Yes. Okay. Um, and then I would like to ask if we could sit down on the climate survey results. I found that report very challenging to understand. Okay. Um, and I'm wondering if, if we could work together to find a way to represent the material in a more comprehensible fashion, sort Absolutely. of dice it and slice it a different way? Absolutely. Okay, I appreciate that. And then there was uh, a bill that uh, risk assessment surveys mm -hmm. were supposed to be completed. Uh, were those ever done, or am Absolutely. I wrong about the date on that one, too? No, that was issued to agencies, uh, and they, agency EEO officers who completed them. The requirement for that bill was to take the results of that, create a, mit a risk mitigation plan, right. and include that in their quarterly EEO plan updates. That's all happening. That's all happening. Is that information public? I don't know. I've, I'd have to get back to you on that. Okay. I'd like to follow up more, and we'll just set up meetings and continue. Was, uh, no? Your staff is saying no, not public. Required? It's okay. No, it's not public. It's not required to be public. Agency EEO plans are not public. I'm looking forward to meeting with you. Yes. Thank you so much for your <laughs> time and all your hard work in getting this off the ground. I really do think first year is the hardest. Um, and what's so critical about this, and I commend you on, we're opening the door to transparency. That was really just the first goal of all of this, is to be, let, let's try to get out in the open what, what is happening behind closed doors. Um, and I think we're on our way to achieving that first goal. Um, I think there's a lot more work to be done, but we really do want to extend my gratitude to DCAS for, for starting this good, important work. I think we share that goal, um, and I think uh, all of the work um, of, of the team, and also the, the support uh, also from, from, from this side of the house and the other side of the house, um, we were all very much aligned in really pushing this issue forward, start, starting with sexual harassment prevention. Um, and I think ev every agency head has been called in and said, hey, where are your numbers? And you know, you're missing X percent. So there's a lot of work uh, going on in order to push this issue through, starting from the top all the way down and across. So we're very much aligned. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We have been joined by Councilmember Francisco Moya and Robert Cornegie, and we have questions from Councilmember Adrian Adams. Thank you so much, Commissioner, for being here today. Your testimony um, is very, very insightful. Thank my colleague, uh, Helen Rosenthal, for um, following through with all of those questions and your um, your answers, really, really important legislation that we're really proud of, and just thank you and your staff for following through um, on that legislation. So uh, just one, one um, particular question that I had in line with the new legislation that we have uh, ongoing regarding the diaper bill. Can you give us an update on the status of the implementation of Local Law 182 um, of 2018? Can you give us an update on that? Absolutely. So the, the law only recently became effective in March of this year. However, before March of this year, we had the contracts set up um, for, for the diapers. Uh, we have been working with agencies to make them aware that this is a resource that is available to them in order to, to use and comply uh, for on, on their end. Do you know um, how um, how uh, the agencies uh, will provide written notices to parents in designated languages regarding the availability of diapers and wipes? 
So the way that uh, city procurement, or our, our role in city procurement um, is, is that we set up the contracts for agency use, and not just limited to this bill, but to, for all of the goods that we provide for, for city usage. Um, the way this bill is written, my understanding is that uh, the social services agencies would be required to comply with additional portions that you mentioned, like notice, um, I think signage is part of it. Um, we don't have insight into their operations or practices, um, and I think, you know, we, we would be happy to work with, if there's an issue on, on our side, on the contract side, we would work with them, but in terms of implementing um, on their different sites, we don't have line of sight into that piece. Okay, um, my final question is the cost of the program. Do you know the, the cost of the program? So again, we have contracts set up, which I might have the total value of them somewhere, um, but in terms of usage, you know, because the contract, the law went in effect in March, our numbers aren't, you know, super high. What we can do, though, is come back and give you an updated utilization um, rate on a quarterly basis, if you'd like, just so that you can see progress of that. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Okay, uh, we have um, questions from uh, Councilmember Carnegie. Thank you, Chair Jerome. Hi, hi Commissioner. How are you? Um, in the past, I've asked, as the former chair of uh, small business, um, to try to get a, an assessment on um, DCAS properties in their portfolio. Mm -hmm. And as new contracts begin to emerge, or new lease agreements begin to emerge, to have the city demonstrate its commitment to retail affordability by being the first to use DCAS properties in a way not at market rate, but to begin to, um, you know, do, do, first of all, do a round of assessment, see when new leases are becoming available, and begin to offer those leases to small businesses in the city um, at below market rent. Do, do you know where we are with that? So we're always looking for, for ways to maximize the city-owned properties, and I think we undertook that analysis. Um, I think we, we, we looked at the, our current leases that we have now, and we're able to determine the number of small businesses that are actually on our leases. Do you have those numbers? Mm -hmm. well, yeah. out, out of the current leases that we have in place now, our calculations are about 80% are small businesses. But what we're trying to do is roll out a new- I'm sorry, did you say eight or 80? 80, 80% 80, 80 go to small businesses. So individuals or small businesses, not something that on the face of it looks like a, you know, a large corporation. We're trying to roll out a new program to actually have more communications about what constitutes a small business. And I know we have reached out and would like to sit down with you before we you know, finalize what this would look like, but it would ensure such leases that go to uh, you know, larger corporations are paying full market value and that we can give a discount and ensure that we can keep the small businesses in place and that they have you know, an edge that the city can give them by giving a, a discount. So in looking at that, and we're, we're almost ready to share our thoughts on what this new policy would look like and would welcome the opportunity to review it with you. Right, so I guess I don't have to argue the point that, that you know, we as a city have a responsibility in this affordability crisis, especially around commercial businesses, um, uh, with, all, with all of the high vacancy rates um, and warehousing and those kinds of suggestions that we as a city can't, shouldn't participate in that. We've had that conversation, so I'm not gonna beat, you know, I'm not gonna beat that, but, um, as soon as you could get back to me on that, I'd love to be able to report that the city is meeting its responsibility, as we've articulated, um, of, of being a responsible uh, kind of landlord in that way. We would love to sit down and walk you through our current portfolio and what, we've, what we're thinking of moving forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I have some follow-up questions. Uh, let me start off with solar panels. In fiscal 2018, the city installed a cumulative total of 10.5 megawatts across the city. However, we have a goal of installing 100 megawatts by 2025. Um, can you give the um, committee an update on how many solar panels we have installed up to date? Yes. Uh -oh. Okay. So, Currently, we have completed 
57 projects for a total of 10.6 megawatts. However, we are currently working, and they're in progress, currently being installed, 103 uh, projects that total 18 megawatts. We've identified another 106 that will be coming on, or that will be starting soon, uh, that will be, that have the equivalent of uh, 27.1 megawatts. So overall, between completed, in progress, pipeline, uh, it, it totals 266 um, projects uh, that total 55.7 megawatts. And How much total, I'm sorry. I'm sorry? The, what was the total? The total megawatts, 55.7 either okay. completed, in progress, or identified. And I'm just going to quickly turn over, <laughs> check over to see, make sure that I didn't miss. Uh, all right. okay. okay, let me swear you in. Yep. Okay. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Thank you. Yeah, yeah you can I start. Think, <laughs> I think, I think uh, the commissioner covered that, but if you have additional deep questions on that, I'll be happy to answer them. Okay, so are we on track to get up to the 100 by 2025? Um, I think, you know, we've got a tenfold increase since 2014 in the number of megawatts installed, but we have a long way to go. We've identified uh, approximately 70 megawatts of the 100 megawatt goal of where they can be installed, um, but I think we're going to need to ramp up the the scale of deployment each year in order to achieve that goal. Okay, thank you. Just a little bit about the capital budget. In your 10-year capital strategy, DCAS has a lump sum um, line titled Energy Efficiency Measures that totals 2.9 billion. However, this offers little transparency on the types of capital projects that fall under this funding as it is all held in one uh, huge lump sum, sum line. Have you identified ways in which you can break this funding down into numerous budget lines? I'm sorry, can you repeat the last part? It's, can, have you identified any ways you can break those numbers down into uh, numerous budget lines? It's a $2.9 billion uh, lump sum line. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so that, that's all for energy efficiency and clean energy programs, uh, typically the way uh, we operate it is each year we go out with solicitations to the agencies for projects to do, um, both on the capital and the expense side. And so each year we get that project list and then we, we build that in. Um, going forward, we are going to supplement those practices with um, a, a more strategic alignment with agencies' capital plans um, so that we can tie these energy efficiency projects and clean energy projects to capital projects that they may already be doing in the out years. And in this way, we can better build our queue of out year work to match that. Um, so going on a going forward basis, we should have uh, more, more projects programmed. Do we have those lists that you're talking about that you mentioned in, in when you started? Uh, I'm sorry, which Do we list? have those lists that you mentioned when you started of the projects? Uh, we, we can provide a project okay. list. Yep. If there's specific project list you're looking for, we can, we can provide okay. that. Okay. Thank you for that. And I have one other one, um, reverse auctions. DCAS uh, executive budget includes project, projected savings of $10 million in fiscal 2020 through reverse auctions. Can you tell the committee how you plan on realizing these savings in fiscal 2020? This is a, a citywide savings program initiative led by OMB. Um, they are running point on what they perceive can be the uh, savings realized from uh, doing reverse auctions. Uh, my understanding is that they're working with the Mayor's Office of Contracts uh, through Passport um, to be able to, to hopefully uh, program reverse bids for some city commodities into the passport system. But um, they placed the savings in DCAS's budget temporarily until that program gets off the ground and those agencies that participate, if it's applicable and, and is allowed by the law, um, they would then remove or reduce 
that allocation savings from our budget and program those savings into the agencies that are realizing those savings. But for DCAS, it was just a, a repository in terms of where they wanted to centrally place it because they don't know citywide by agency where these savings will be occurring. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chair Cabrera. Thank you so much. Uh, let me get back to energy management. Uh, mm -hmm. Which initiative from the Mayor's Green New Deal plan that was just announced will be related to DCAS $59.3 million for energy management initiative? Would it include the increase electric vehicle chargers? Would this initiative lead to budgetary saving? And if so, what is your anticipated saving projection? So the, the Green New Deal um, proposal or plan, um, uh, the our portion has to do with governmental operations, and that really does focus both on our buildings and fleet primarily. So the $59 million within the, the Department of Energy Management uh, group really is to ramp up all of our energy efficiency programs and Anthony can speak to uh, more details on how we expect to effectuate that um, and actually I'll just turn it over and but there is a fleet component as well yeah. good morning um, so the 60 million will be for projects that you know span the gamut from retro commissioning lighting controls HVAC steam optimization and so forth um, to improve the buildings energy efficiencies and we expect that we'll hit between 300 and 400 buildings with that. Um, th this is not a um, savings program in terms of dollars. Some of these things cost additional money to do. Uh, the metrics that I can give you are on a dollar per metric ton of avoided emissions from implementing these projects, as well as a, a payback period. Um, and so, you, depending on what actual projects get completed, will change those two metrics that I just mentioned. But just for context, um, overall, historically, all of our pro projects so far is about um, $4,000 per metric ton um, in avoided emissions. And, and payback ranges, depending on the type of, of project, anywhere from three years to, um, you know, it, it could be 70 years if it's a insulation of, of walls and things like that. So there's no savings then? Correct. It's just no. good envi environmental practice, but is there any savings? For the, for the building side, um, it's not a savings program. Okay. Um, however, from the fleet side, and Keith Kerman, who can join me here, can, can continue the discussion, but uh, on a parallel track or included in this, uh, within this uh, climate change uh, plan, the mayor recently announced an executive order to reduce our fleet uh, by a thousand uh, vehicles right. um, and to increase our use of electric vehicles, um, reduce the number of commuters and downsizing a number of uh, from going from SUVs to to sedans. All of those things, those uh, those proposals, there actually is a cost savings component to it, and I can toss it over so to you. So before Keith. we go to the oh. vehicle, why is I, I would imagine if a building is more environmentally sound that there would be a, a cost saving. I mean, if you're using, for example, uh, solar panels, if you, you know, if you change the windows, I know the building, con uh, our colleague Constantinides uh, was championing and was able to pass, uh, you know, the, this changing of the windows and so forth. Why, why are those not, why wouldn't that translate into savings. Yes. Yeah, so let, let me clarify. Um, we, we measure the savings through the payback period. So how long does it take to pay back the investment that you've made? And so it, that, that varies widely, as I mentioned before. It could, be a, it could be less than a year to 70 years or plus, depending on the type of, of project that you install. But yes, eventually there, there is a savings. So, it, and that's measured by the number of years it takes to pay back the investment. But we, we don't know what that is then. Is I, that I, what I hear? I, I can give you average numbers depending on the type of um, intervention that we're talking about. So if there's a specific intervention, I'm happy to provide you data. But overall, when it comes to the buildings, do you have like, 
What an average. I'm just trying to get a picture yeah. uh, of what that I mean, looks if you, like. If you lump in every type of uh, intervention possible from, you know, say a simple lighting upgrade to something that's much more intrusive, intensive, and uh, putting insulation in walls, uh, triple pane glass windows, and so forth, um, lumping all that together, it, it's probably around a 20 year payback. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. And then the vehicle piece, I know you wanted to interject. Sure, sure. I'm going to need this way in. Oh. Do, you affirm that your do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes. Thank you. Hi, Keith Kerman, um, the Chief Fleet Officer. So on the electric vehicle side that you mentioned in the chargers, there is a savings program. It's four years, fiscal year 19 to 22, across all agencies that operate cars, and it's $9.7 million over the four years. And where that savings comes from, and, and it's good news for those following electric vehicle adoption, is that what we're finding, especially in light duty electric vehicles, is the maintenance is extraordinarily low as it should be. You don't have a gas engine to maintain. Even the brake maintenance is less. There are basically fewer things to brake on an electric car. It's a very simple car, so. Well, let me stop you right there. Isn't it true, though, that within eight years, you gotta change the main battery? The, you know, it's very, very interesting costly. question about battery life. We used to hear that about the Toyota Prius and the hybrids. You'd have to change the batteries. In 20 years, I've never changed a battery unless we crashed a vehicle. Um, on the electric vehicle side, there's always, you really don't have to replace a battery. There will be some lessening of the effectiveness of a battery, right? Batteries will lose some of their holding capacity. If you have a 220 mile range, maybe in eight years, you're gonna be at 180 mile range. But we do not replace batteries in scale like that, that fear that's been out there. That just doesn't happen. I, I can't think of a battery replacement for maintenance we've ever done. Um, and so the maintenance cost right now, and we put out a report publicly on this very recently, about 60% less for the electric vehicles really? than for their, their counterparts, as well, of course, as you're getting the fuel savings. So, so on that side, maintenance and fuel, we, we have worked with OMB and, and actually put in a savings program. That now I could tell my wife to buy me an electric car. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, let me ask you. Uh, uh, when it comes to uh, these, the chargers, uh, are they only for our city vehicle, or are we going to be able to allow the public to use them and uh, and then collect some revenue? So, so the the one the project that we're um, leading, and Keith can talk more about that. It's solely for city government operations, but. I don't know if you want to elaborate. Yeah, so there are two project streams. One is the DCAS $10 million that you see in the budget. That is mostly focused on the city fleet. Um, almost one third of all the electric vehicles in the city at the moment registered are in fact operated through DCAS by city agencies. So we have an enormous charging demand. And honestly, you know, we just announced that we'd hit 2,200 electric cars. We're bringing in electric cars somewhat quicker than we can charge them. So we need to focus. Um, certainly wherever we can offer public availability as we go along on this project, we will. But then DOT and the Mayor's Office of Sustainability are also leading um, what's been publicly announced, the public charging focus component of that, which is really about public charging. So there I, are two projects running simultaneously. Are, are these hybrid vehicles or strictly all electric? The city has both. So we have about 600 of our units are all electric. Then we have the rest that are hybrid electric. Um, How many are the rest? Well, that would be about 1,600 that are hybrid plug-in electric. Not hybrid, but plug-in electric. You know, one reason- You know, you know what my fear is, right? Remember when we had the blackout and it lasted three days? What would happen in that instance? And then all your city vehicles can't be recharged. Well, interestingly, one of the reasons we invest in plug-in hybrids is to have emergency options, right? So you plug it in on a regular day, and most days are regular days, and you're not using fuel, but if you're in a hurricane emergency or another emergency and you just kind of can't wait to charge, 
then you're, you're going to have that option. But interesting enough, one of the charging projects we put in place for the very issue you just mentioned is we are the largest investor in the world in these solar carports. They're freestanding, independent carports. There's one at the municipal building, um, and they're all over the city now. We have 86 of them. And so those do not depend on the grid. So are they, I, I have, what's the cap how many can they service? On uh, a regular charge? day, it's about three a unit. Um, but certainly in an emergency, you know, on a regular day, we're also not tapping out the batteries and using every piece of charge. Right. You know, in an how emergency. How many you anticipate you need? Excuse me? How many you anticipate, how many more do you anticipate that you need well, so you don't have to We have, have our last it? 20 being delivered now. That'll bring us to 86. And then we have to establish, you know, we haven't, we haven't funded a next round with OMB yet, but we will do that. We're, we're finishing up the project we have. What's the, what's the cost per charger? Uh, one of those charging stations. The large char the solar carport freestanding is about sixty thousand dollars. So it's a it's you know we're an early investor. It's a tremendous product. Obviously, like many things we invest in in the sustainable world, we'd love to see that price come down and scale it up. Mm -hmm. um, but we see that a lot. You know, when we first bought Priuses and hybrid vehicles, they were very expensive. Now they're less expensive than anything. We had the Nissan Leaf on contract for $32,000 four years ago. It's now on contract for $22,000. So we, you know, we do try and invest in these technologies early, um, you know, and, and we do expect to see reductions. But they also operate as emergency generators, which is the issue you're bringing up. And so as emergency generators, they are a pretty good insurance policy. How long, uh, well, two questions. One, in terms of economy of scales, uh, do you buy in bundles or do you just buy three or four units at a time? At what point do we end up uh, seeing a cost saving if we're able to buy a large amount of them? And second, what, what do you estimate uh, in terms of the charging, which by the way, I'm very happy about to hear. I, I, I'm, I'm moving in the direction that I, I like to see as many as we need. So we don't have to rely um, you know, petroleum, gas, and all the emissions that come out of that uh, uh, as well. But at what point does it start paying for itself? Uh, how many years? Well, well these, are, these are, you know, we're, in, in, with the solar carports, we're an energy producer now. So they will more or less pay for themselves at about 30 years of life. So, you know, go over 30 years, they will pay for themselves on the offsets of fuel. Um, that's a little bit higher than we would want. And, you know, we're early. But you know, part of what we're doing is creating a marketplace. Yesterday, we met with another company who's selling the same product who wants to get into this business. And what we see in a lot of cases is we start as an early adopter, but then we are creating a more competitive marketplace. More companies are coming in offering these products. And that's where you see the price reduction. In the truck side guard program, we saw that. We started, we were paying $3,000. No one, one company in North America provided them. We now have five companies and we're down to $1,800 a unit. So we're hoping to see that same kind of trend. And again, I will tell you, yes, just yesterday, a new company came into the solar carport business talking about how they could do lower, just as good and lower price carports. So that's what we want to hear. Do, do, do the companies that you're dealing with right now for, for the charger, I, I, are they, uh, have they indicated that we can, they can upgrade that system so it could charge quicker, let's say three years down the line? You know, just like Tesla, they come with technology, you know, just every couple of years. Uh, would they be able to upgrade, take part of, you know, maybe their battery retention. It, it's already, the first set we bought and announced of 33 had a 30 kilowatt battery. The last 50 have a 40 kilowatt battery. So yeah, that's already but happened. But the first ones, were they able to change that battery to 50 kilos? You see well, what I'm saying? Well, we went from 30 to 40 and you know, with the next round, we'll keep pushing that forward. So no, no but uh, maybe I'm not ex explaining my question right. So the one you started with 30, are they able to remove that battery and say, hey, now we got a 50 kilo and replace that 30 so you can retain more 
there would be a you know obviously if you were to do effectively a retrofit there'd be a there'd be a cost there'd be a cost implication to that it's probably more cost effective to just keep expanding the number of units with the best technology right generally we don't go back in vehicle technology uh, in that manner we just get the next best thing and and keep replacing um, but certainly the you know we're trying to grow and create this marketplace and, and we've done this before. Um, hybrids used to be rare, now they're not, and, and we're going we're gonna to build this marketplace on solar carports. And in terms that we have a thousand less vehicles, does that mean that why do we need less vehicles? I mean, is it like, do we have less workforce uh, in need of the vehicles? Do you need an analysis that now you're running the vehicles 24 hours a day? Uh, instead of 12-hour shifts? So we're, we're, how we want to approach the vehicle reduction uh, will be assisted by technology that we're currently installing on all of the fleet uh, called telematics that will be able to deter let us know how much vehicles are being used, whether or not they're used effectively. Uh, we want to make sure that we hit, was it a 60%, 80%? Uh, I can't remember the, yeah, the standard. We, we, through, through what the commission mentioned, we've put in a live telematic system that lets us understand the daily use of vehicles in a way we never could do before. Um, and we're looking for efficiencies. So working with the council, you know, we have a car share, fleet share law. So we're looking at where you can share vehicles as opposed to the traditional model of fleet, which is, you know, I've got a unit or I'm an important person, give me a car. As opposed to, hey, we need to solve your transport issues, but you can share cars and we can share across technology. We put zip car technology now on city cars. So we don't give you a key, a car key, we give you a card key and you go online and reserve the cars. Um, so we can look for where there are efficiencies in vehicles, where we can share vehicles, um, and that's going to be how we, we achieve the reduction. I'm happy to hear that, that you're doing that. I mean, that's pretty innovative. Is any other cities doing uh, the SIP? Approach. We we are we are certainly the largest adopter of that. But to, to be honest, we actually partnered originally with the city of Chicago on our original contract. So Chicago actually was a a real partner on this. Um, I believe Houston also has a program here. Um, but but we're certainly the largest implementer by far. And and how much uh, is the car contract uh, for that? Um, there's, there's a fee, I would have to get you the particular fee, but actually the shared program is also a savings program, right? We're, re we're not spending more money by sharing vehicles, we're reducing a thousand vehicles and cutting the budget by sharing vehicles. Um, but there's a subscription cost, a monthly cost for the sharing technology. I, I, could, I would have to get that cost. Thousand vehicles that you're about to uh, put into auction, uh, what are the years, uh, what are the make? It's, so agencies are actually finalizing and developing their plans now. It is going to be a mix, so it's going to include about 70% light duty vehicles and 30% medium and heavy duty vehicles. So there are efficiencies as well in the trucking side. Um, the other you know, years, uh, you said uh, 2000. Well, well there'll always be the older. Mo you know, we don't salvage vehicles that are that are newer. We're always right. going to look to the older fleet. So usually, 10 or more years is gotcha. when we look to auction vehicles. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. okay we just want to say we were joined by Councilman Mazel, uh, and um, that, that's it for this panel. And uh, we thank you for coming in, and uh, we look forward to working with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner. Have a good so we'll take a little break for about 10 or 15 minutes.
this or the name I might not have heard this.
Yeah, because I worked at yeah. yeah. Sir. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Okay, uh, we will now resume the City Council's hearing on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. The Finance Committee is joined by the Committee on Governmental Operations, chaired by Councilmember Fernando Cabrera. We've been joined by my colleagues Alan Maisel, Mark uh, Jonai, uh, Councilmember Jimmy Van Bramer, and I think others will be joining us shortly. We just heard from the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, and now we'll hear from Michael Ryan, Executive Director of the Board of Elections. In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement, but before we hear testimony, I will open the mic to my co-chair, Council Member Cabrera. Thank you so much, uh, co-chair, and I would like to welcome Executive Director Michael J. Ryan, Executive Director of Board of Elections. Thank you, Ex Executive Director, for testifying before us today. The BOE Fiscal 2020 Executive Budget totals $246 million, including $115.8 $8 million in personnel services funding to support 517 full-time positions. The BOE is responsible for conducting all elections in the City of New York, federal, state, and local. It registers voters, maintains the city's voter registration list, and maintains and operates poll sites, among various other election-related functions. The New York State Legislature recently passed a major package of electoral forms that will have a dramatic impact on the way elections are conducted in the state of New York, including a early voting, the synchronization of federal state primaries, and registration portability across the state. <clears throat> Excuse me, following up on the oversight hearing the Government Operations Committee held last month on these topics. We would like to hear from the BOE about the logistics of implementing this new election reform, as well as the costs. In addition, we would like to discuss the costs uh, for future elections 
and BOE's ongoing plans to implement early voting, among other topics. And with that, I'll give it back to the co-chair, Danny Drum. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna ask council to swear the panel in. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Would you like to start? Is your mic on? Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, once more with feeling. There you go. Uh, <laughs> uh, good afternoon, Chair Cabrera and Chair Drum and members of the New York City Council's Committees on Governmental Operations and Finance. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you uh, to give testimony with respect to the Board's fiscal year uh, 2020 uh, budget. Joining me at the table uh, to my left is Deputy Executive Director uh, Dawn Sandow. Uh, as we have uh, done in the past, the Board has prepared uh, testimony and worked very closely with the administration with respect to the budgetary needs for uh, the upcoming fiscal year. Um, I will, uh, with the approval of the committee, forego the formal reading of the testimony, uh, give an overview, and then we can move uh, to the media portion of the program, which I know you all are interested in asking questions about various topics. Um, so uh, we have gone over fiscal year uh, 2019 uh, in some uh, detail in other hearings. A um, couple of things that have uh, been addressed uh, in, perhaps in hearings uh, that were not addressed in previous hearings. We did have a citywide special election uh, on February 26, 2019. We also, as a result of that special election, had to have a special election this week uh, in the 45th Council District on uh, Tuesday in Brooklyn. Uh, and we have worked closely with the administration uh, to cover those funds as new needs, uh, as um, special elections cannot be uh, predicted. Uh, so the, we are covered for those, uh, and we don't have um, uh, any issues related to current funds owed uh, by the City of New York uh, for any shortfalls. Um, starting in January of 2019, uh, as uh, many of us are aware, uh, we will be commencing uh, early voting, starting with the November uh, 2019 general election, which really bleeds back into October. October 26th, I believe, is the first day. That will be the first uh, foray into early voting, uh, and then they will be conducted um, each, uh, for each election event uh, moving forward for a period of nine days uh, for early voting plus election day. Uh, and that will be inclusive of two Saturdays and two Sundays. Uh, we also have a bit of good news. That's a, that's a challenge, but another bit of good news is the primary date has been unified uh, from September uh, into June. So primaries moving forward will be unified on the last or the fourth Tuesday, not the last Tuesday, the fourth Tuesday uh, in June uh, each year moving forward. Uh, and in part due to the uh, early voting uh, passage, uh, but also in part due to uh, just good improvement for the system. The state legislature has authorized uh, the use of electronic poll books. Uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop right there for a second and just uh, remind everyone, uh, as we testified in the early voting hearing a few weeks back, that the vendors for the e-poll books must be approved by the State Board of Elections. They're not gonna go through a certification process the same way as the voting systems do, uh, but they do have an approval process. That approval process is ongoing, uh, and our understanding is that it will be completed uh, by June uh, the 6th. And so uh, once that process uh, is completed, we'll be able to move forward uh, with our plans. Uh, the state procurement process, the OGS process, is not going to be completed in time for the City Board of Elections to make use of it. That's expected to be completed in July, and that will be too late for us uh, to act and then expect that we're going to be able to complete our poll worker training and, and procure the devices in time. So 
Moving on to the, to the balance of uh, this coming fiscal year, uh, the current executive budget is, gives the agency $246 million. $115.8 million is allocated for personal services, which includes both poll worker pay and uh, staff pay, uh, as well as $130.1 million for OTPS. Um, you'll note that that is a substantial increase over what has been previously allocated, uh, and that is to accommodate the um, early voting uh, bills that were passed. Uh, Seventy-five million dollars of that uh, is allocated for the three early voting periods. That would be presently uh, November, the presidential primary, which looks like it's going to be the end of April, and then the June primary, uh, which will occur now at the end of the fiscal year as opposed to uh, in September. And an additional twenty-one million dollars uh, for the procurement of poll books. These figures were uh, discussed and determined in conjunction with the Mayor's Office uh, of Management and Budget, keeping in mind that the early voting statute passed January 24th, 2019, and our initial budget testimony before the City Council was on March the 12th, uh, 2019, so we came to these numbers um, very quickly, and to be responsible uh, budget, budgetarily and fiscally. The idea was to establish an outside number, uh, and if less funds were expended, that would put the city in a better position than if we grossly underestimated the budget and then uh, had to scramble to try to find uh, additional funds elsewhere. And that was something that was discussed uh, in some detail with our budget folks and the Office of Management and Budget when these uh, numbers uh, were established. I would also like to uh, remind the members of this committee that all of these numbers are, as yet, are a work in progress. And that uh, until all of the plans are finalized, until we know exactly what uh, machines we're going to be using and what additional extra services we might have to pay for in order to get uh, the electronic poll books implemented, it is impossible in this particular year to, to really sharpen that pencil and put a fine point on it. Moving forward, we of course will be able to do that uh, as we uh, have uh, the knowledge uh, and the experience and some of these expenses will in fact be more or less one-time expenses. We always know that equipment does wear out and break down over the course of time, uh, but the uh, PS portion of the budget with respect to poll workers and with respect to our staff will be ongoing repetitive costs with respect to the budget. Um, so uh, moving on to the, the next piece of the puzzle that I, I, I want the committee to understand and to keep in mind. We're working under a very compressed time frame. We want to make sure this process works. We want to get it off the ground and have it be a firm foundation upon which we can rest the balance of the process. There has been uh, a lot of talk about the number of sites and that's uh, been something that's been getting a lot of attention. Uh, and one of the things that I want to make sure that we don't end up, we don't end up like Howard Hughes when he built the Spruce Goose that we build this big, beautiful thing, but it really doesn't fly. We want to make sure that we take it, uh, build that foundation, work with all of the communities if there's any uh, assumptions or assessments that we made uh, that require adjustment. We should have a fair and reasonable and open conversation with all of the individuals uh, that uh, have an interest in this process. Uh, we commit to this council and to the voters of the city of New York that we will make that process as open and as inclusive as time allows. We also have to understand that we're really working under very, very uh, compressed time frames. Uh, we do have weekly meetings. There have been people showing up. Uh, we've had um, some uh, 
meetings with, uh, at least a meeting with uh, leadership from the state legislature. There's uh, another meeting scheduled with elected officials uh, for next week, I believe in the borough of Queens, and we're, and we're happy to do that on a round robin basis and get to everybody and get all of the input uh, that will be necessary uh, to make sure that A, the process works, and B, uh, that people have faith in it, and that they feel that whatever concerns uh, they had were at least heard uh, and hopefully uh, addressed. But I, I do want to stress, November is a launching point, not an ending point. That's, November's not the destination. November is the start of the journey. And I want us all hopefully to work together and, and say, we've created over the course of time in an evolutionary way an early voting process that works for everybody. Um, we can certainly uh, talk uh, with respect to the uh, e-poll books and what they, uh, what they might mean for us. Um, it's a bit daunting. Uh, we have to make sure that we engage in a program uh, according to the state rules where nobody can double vote. Uh, so the e-poll books are uh, an essential element of that. But, here, but there's some good news here. We're going to use them for election day two. And so we're finally going to move past the, you know, A to L, M to Z, you know, and all of these lines that, that cross over. We're going to rework our poll sites uh, moving forward so that you can go to uh, check-in stations. Uh, and we'll certainly uh, build that into the process. And that will help uh, in moving the lines along uh, more quickly. Uh, so when we get to the... Um, the question and answer uh, period of this, I, I would like this committee to think about a couple of things. Sites are important. They are. The number of sites are important. But while we're doing that, we also have to remember that the sites have to be staffed and they have to have equipment. And in a city as large and diverse as New York City and with needs differing needs. There's been some hay made over Staten Island having a certain number of sites and another borough having a certain number of sites. There are logistical challenges in Staten Island that are different than the logistical challenges uh, in Brooklyn or Queens. Staten Island is spread out. It doesn't have as much uh, access to, uh, to public transportation. There's one train uh, that runs uh, from St. George to Tottenville, uh, and uh, the other boroughs have some access uh, better access to public transportation, but there are challenges in Queens as well where the main hubs of how people uh, commute uh, back and forth into the city um, are uh, not as perhaps convenient uh, as uh, the MTA or others would, would like if they had an opportunity to redesign uh, the process and the system uh, moving forward. So uh, our testimony is there. I'm uh, happy uh, to answer uh, any questions. If there's something that I did not uh, highlight sufficiently, I'm certain that uh, as the questions go around, uh, the dais will have an opportunity to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Executive Director. And um, yeah, we have some questions. Um, just, I, I went up to the City Council and where we had a demonstration for the machines. That was, those are the machines you're talking about. So, no. present, presently, um, there, was, there was, I'm certain, one machine uh, that was uh, a touchscreen machine. Uh, that machine is not presently certified by the State Board of Elections, uh, and that was a machine that we had asked if it would be available for early voting, uh, and the State Board of Elections said no. So what we're talking about here is, for the early voting sites, I'm sure uh, that's your, your point of interest. Electronic poll books. Right, so a way to access the voter information electronically in a tablet-style uh, device that links to a ballot-on-demand system so that once we check you in at your poll site or at your early voting site, it will then tell the uh, ballot-on-demand system what ballot to print for you. And then we'll be able to distribute that ballot uh, to the voters. The other choice would have been to essentially print double the amount of paper ballots uh, that we would ordinarily print for an election and then have stacks 
of ballots available at the early voting sites uh, for distribution in what's termed as a pick and pull system. So if you can envision a 200 slot uh, inter-office mailbox with all of the different ballots in there and then you come in you want your ballot and some poor poll worker has to go fish through these uh, ballots, that system would have been implemented if we had no other choice, but it would have been a disaster. This ballot on demand system at least uh, lets us take uh, a step forward uh, and process uh, the voters uh, better than they might have uh, been otherwise. So the ballots will be printed after you sign in? Correct. So basically what happens is you, you, you sign in at the, the, the poll book and there's a link between that device and the, and the ballot on demand printer and it tells the ballot on demand printer what ballot to print for you based on uh, the information that's in the voter registration system. Okay, you know I used to work for the Department of Education. I was a teacher for 25 years. One of the biggest problems that we faced and they still continue to face today is bandwidth in schools. So do you think that that's going to be a problem at some of these sites? So in addition to, and that's some of the other technology money that we're looking for, uh, we have uh, had conversations with vendors and they have indicated to us what our needs should be. And the idea behind this would also to be to have cradle points uh, that would also serve as you know, beefier, more substantial battery backup systems in the event of a loss of power. Uh, so uh, right now, for the tablets that we use to transmit the results, we use MiFi's that are leveraged through our Verizon contract. Um, and for what we're asking them to do, they're fine. They, we're just asking them to push numbers at the end of the night, you know, for the most part, or emails. This it, oftentimes, when you go into a school, you cannot, we give them laptops, we give them, um, uh, some, in some cases, schools will buy um, uh, uh, iPads and stuff. They can't get online. Right. So, so the cradle points will um, have a more industrial uh, capacity. So it's not the same thing as the MiFi, which has a weaker signal. And we've also had some conversations, uh, preliminary uh, mm -hmm. yet, but AT&T and Verizon, uh, we're going to work with them uh, to hopefully create a dedicated system. They say it's doable. Uh, the details haven't been worked out, but to, 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 for them to give us access uh, to more bandwidth on election days so that we don't have these problems. That said, the devices themselves will have uh, the entirety of the voter record stored on them as well. So even if you lost your bandwidth for the day, they'd still be able to communicate within the four walls of that poll site with the ballot on demand system. So the external communication to the outside world might uh, uh, be interrupted, but the internal communication at the poll sites would not. Okay, good, good luck with that because they, um, uh, it's been difficult dealing with the DOE on this issue, believe me. Um, but anyway, um, I do, let me talk a little bit about uh, ranked choice voting. The Charter Revision Commission's prelimin preliminary staff budget published in April 19 proposes a system of ranked choice voting for city elections. Excuse me, do you anticipate taking a public position on ranked choice voting in advance of the vote on the charter revision? So we <coughs> were invited to testify uh, at the commission hearing and we did testify. Uh, the, the board of commissioners typically, uh, given the political nature of these votes, refrains from offering uh, yes, this is a good idea or no, this is a bad idea advice, uh, but we did give uh, information about what it would mean to implement. Ranked choice voting as a general term means, you know, one thing, but the, really the devil is in the details. It's how does this commission determine how we're going to implement ranked choice voting? What does it mean? Is it going to be weighted in ranked choice voting? Are you going to get more points, if you will, for a first place vote as opposed to a second place vote? All of that has to be determined. And the other thing that I want this committee to understand is, we don't control the uh, operating systems of the, of the operating system of the voting system. That has to be uh, approved, tested, uh, and uh, certified by the State Board of Elections. So if there is a ranked choice voting statute uh, that's passed, uh, you know, on the city charter, I should say, uh, the current system is not set up to deal with it. And that would then have to go back to the State Board of, uh, for certification. 
The other choice is if it was an immediate implementation, and this is something that I made the, the uh, committee aware of, what you would have to do is look at the ground rules that they've established for early, uh, for ranked choice voting, and then come up with an acceptable algorithm to apply to the results. So for those offices that prior to certification by the state, for those offices that were the subject of ranked choice voting, depending on how complex they make uh, the rules, uh, you might not know the results of that election. Uh, well, you certainly won't know it within uh, the, the 20 minutes that we had for the 45th uh, in, in Brooklyn on Tuesday, uh, but it will likely be delayed uh, for several days uh, so that we can gather all of that information. That's you know, and, and we can't, and, and, and just to be clear, we don't have the authority to implement it on our own. The State Board of Elections would have to take a look at it. They'd have to uh, recommend uh, changes to the, uh, to the system. The vendor would also have to take a look at it and see what their technological solution was going to be. Uh, and then at that point, uh, they would certify a new system and the system would take care of itself. But that's going to take some time. So at a bare minimum, we would hope that uh, it would not be an immediate implementation, that there would be a sufficient date for implementation, and that needs to be done in consultation with our election system vendor and the, uh, and the State Board of Elections. So I'd hope prior to that that the committee would reach out to the State Board and say, if we pass this, how long is it going to take for you guys to get your work done? I gather from what you're saying that um, if the um, uh, ranked choice voting were to be implemented, you would need additional resources um, overall, but also because the new systems that you're bringing in for voting, the new machines, the new um, uh, vote counting system that we were talking about before is not set up for this either. Right. So right now, we don't have any plans to bring any new systems in. We would still be dealing with paper ballots and the DS-200 scanners. What I'm saying is uh, the DS-200 operates on what they call firmware. I don't know why it's not software. It's firmware. Uh, and that has to be changed in order to do the mathematical calculation to accommodate ranked choice voting. We don't have the authority to tell the vendor to change it. That authority rests with the State Board of Elections. So this is at, this is at least a two-step, uh, maybe even a three-step process. State Board, vendor, uh, and we're actually, honestly, until the certification happens, we're the least important element of that. Because if the system is set up, to calculate the results, then our, our work gets done by the, by the machine. If they're not, and we're forced to implement, then we have to develop an acceptable algorithm, taking all of the factors into account and working with the vendor, to then apply that algorithm after the election. And the thing that I don't like about that, if, and this is just me talking as the election administrator, the minute you start talking about applying algorithms to election results, I think you run the risk of undermining public uh, confidence. Uh, it sounds spooky when you say that. Uh, and, and the fact that we now, the one thing that I am proud of for certain, and I'm very, very proud of our staff for how well they do it, we're very good at getting the election results done uh, on election night. And that is the one piece of the puzzle that we absolutely 100% control. And we do it very well. To now suddenly find ourselves in a situation where not of our doing, election results are delayed. Um, it's not a path I would prefer to go down, but certainly these are decisions uh, that will get made outside the, uh, the Board of Elections. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the New York State budget for fiscal 2020 includes $10 million to reimburse the New York City Board of Elections for costs related to implementing the early voting and includes $14.7 million for electronic poll books. Uh, anticipating that the state will not reimburse the city's total cost of implementing early voting, what amount will the BOE ask the city to provide to make up the difference, and when will that ask be made? So the ask, is already, uh, the ask has already been made uh, within the budget numbers that we have uh, submitted. Uh, the $21 uh, million that's uh, also allocated for e-poll books and, uh, well, for e-poll books, was based on uh, a high price point early in this process. 
Uh, and as it's unfolded, we believe that that will be sufficient to cover the cost of the e-poll books and the ballot on demand systems in tandem. Uh, and so we think that that 21 will be uh, sufficient. We understand uh, from the State Board of Elections that the 14.7 for the e-poll books will be allocated this way, that it will be uh, $700,000 held off to the side in reserve for any unanticipated costs so that they have a little bit of padding, and that the remaining $14 million will be divided based on the number of voters per, uh, per jurisdiction. So we should anticipate to get somewhere in the 38 to 40 percent of that money, so 5.3, 5.5 million dollars uh, by reimbursement, but the city would have to outlay. The other money, the 10 million dollars, which is an aid to localities money, is uh, to be allocated as we understand it, 15,000 dollars per poll site per jurisdiction as a one-time reimbursement. Uh, and I would suppose that they'd have to revisit that uh, in, the, you know, in each budget year and see how they're going to continue that aid to localities money. But for right now, it runs from April 1st through uh, March the 30th of 2020. Okay. Uh, the administration provided the BOE with $75 million for early voting sites and provided a list of 222 potential sites that could be used. The administration expressed um, an intention that the money fund the opening of at least 100 sites. The BOE, in response, is uh, using that money to open only 38 sites citywide. Um, so why did you um, choose to go with only 38 early voting sites, and what was the methodology uh, used for choosing those specific sites? So there were numerous considerations uh, that we had to take into account. Um, it's proximity to uh, transportation. Uh, I have my, my notes, I had them someplace, uh, and I don't know what I did with them. I have the, the, the laundry list of, uh, of information, and, and a matter of fact, myself and Mr. Richmond went over this just before we came here and I misplaced the sheet, but it's, um, it's proximity to, the, uh, to public transportation, it's population density, um, also commuter patterns. Uh, all of these factors uh, that we have taken into consideration. But one of the overarching things that we have taken into consideration, of course we have to meet the state law mandates without question. We have uh, discussed this matter with at least eight other jurisdictions, including Miami-Dade, Harris County, uh, Texas, uh, and others. Uh, Chicago, we sent staff, Ms. Uh, Ms. Sandow and another staff member went out to Chicago to observe early voting. Every jurisdiction, including our uh, election consultant election center, has said, don't bite off more than you can chew the first time out of the box. You have to get this thing moving. Now, we've announced 38 sites. I can tell you, although I cannot speak for the commissioners, that there is additional consideration being given, which is part of the reason why we're having uh, meetings uh, with, uh, you know, with elected officials and we plan on meeting with community groups to make sure that what we're doing meets, uh, you know, a basic standard that we can uh, build on. The other thing that we have to keep in mind is the statutory scheme that was devised here presupposes that all elections are not created equally that you might have greater needs in one election and lower needs in another. And the reason we know that is they've built into the, system, into the statutory scheme a 45-day site designation uh, prior to uh, you know, future election events. So by May the 1st, we, every year, we're going to have to designate the, uh, the general election sites. But for a special election or a primary, we can designate sites no later than 45 days before. That presupposes that you will increase uh, and decrease. Uh, and although other jurisdictions have told us that you don't want to fluctuate your early voting sites too much because it causes uh, voter confusion. So these are uh, the things that we have uh, you know, considered. But I'd also like to remind uh, the City Council my testimony from a few weeks back. We've got to look at the timing of this. January 24th, 
bill passes. We had to designate our poll sites by March the 15th. We didn't have to announce the early voting sites until May the 1st, but we had to designate by March the 15th. And we over-designated. And I will tell you, we are getting stacks of letters. I had them with me the last time. Matter of fact, I still have some of them right here, uh, of all of a sudden poll sites uh, that have been designated don't want to be poll sites. That's a challenge. And I want to also point out that the list of 220 sites that we got from uh, the administration are overwhelmingly schools and overwhelmingly sites that we have already used. When you look at the state board rules and regs with respect to 25, for every 25,000 voters we have to have uh, a scanner machine and for every 4,000 voters we have to have a, a privacy booth. We have to have a certain footprint for these rooms. So certainly in the last week we have not gone over all 220 schools. But I also want to point something else out. There is no exemption for smaller election events from early voting. Each election event has to have a total of nine days of early voting. Four days are on the weekend, but you also have to have a day to deliver the equipment and a day to pick up the equipment. So you're talking about impacting these sites for a minimum of 11 days for each election event. Now let's think about Queens for a second. 1.1 million voters, our big city on its own if it wasn't part of New York City, right? We're gonna have a, we're gonna have a general election in November, which now starts in October, October 26th. Depending on the outcome of that general election, we may have a special election in February, depending who wins. The special election rules already don't meet the requirements for early voting because we have to designate our early voting sites 45 days in advance. That means we have to be standing there ready when the mayor issues his proclamation and, and then, uh, and then you know, publish the, the early voting sites. Then a presidential primary in, in April, then a general in, uh, in June. If you talk about, call it 12 days, four election events in one of the largest, in what would be one of the largest cities in America if it was a standalone city, New York, uh, uh, Queens County, you'd have an impact of almost 50 days on whatever facility we use over an eight month period. All of us have to be cognizant of that. We, we can't put the schools out of business either. And because of the requirements that we have and the square footage that we need to take up, can you imagine going to a principal and telling him we're taking your gym away for 12 days? Or we're taking, your, uh, you, we're taking your lunchroom away for 12 days? Oh, and by the way, we're not doing it once. We're doing it four times for 50 days over eight months. We've, we've had these discussions, Councilman. These are difficult things. And so what I'm suggesting here is that we all keep the lines of communication open and that we all remain patient and understand that this is a work in progress. Uh, and when we started to look at early voting sites initially, we were asked and we were thinking about it on our own, so I'm not laying at anybody's feet, to, to try to minimize the impact on schools and see if there was other locations that uh, would be more suitable, particularly you know, for, the, for the younger children. Certainly, we'd like to see CUNY uh, be more forthcoming in terms of, uh, uh, you know, in terms of their willingness uh, and, and, and other uh, uh, locations as well. Uh, we, we're not, uh, we're, we're like the dinner guests you don't want to ring your doorbell sometimes with these locations. Mr. Ryan, one, one of the um, objectives I think of the state legislation was to, um, with early voting, was to uh, encourage or to allow those, those areas, those districts, where you have low voter turnout to increase voter turnout. So, you know, I um, was a district leader in um, the 39th Assembly District. I think that 39th Assembly District has the lowest voter turnout in the whole state. But yet, there's not one early voting site in anywhere near there. I think the, I think the early voter site is located at LaGuardia Community College, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. My question to you is, did you take um, voter turnout into consideration when selecting the sites? 
Well, and that particular location uh, was the subject of a meeting that I was at recently, so I'm more familiar with some of the challenges there than I might be, you know, throughout the city. Um, one of the challenges there is the requirement uh, to make sure that it's along a transportation hub and to try to take into consideration commuter patterns because it's not just the residents of a particular area, it's also how will people get there. Uh, so I can also say, without offering specificity today, that that particular location is the subject, is one of the subjects of further discussion uh, and being reevaluated. Uh, so we put out our list. We expected uh, that we would get some feedback. Uh, although our offices are on the Canyon of Heroes, we weren't expecting a parade uh, once we announced our early voting sites. We, we figured that folks would have uh, not questions and, and, and probably some criticism, but we look at that as an invitation for conversation and, and also uh, ask that we all understand that this is the first step and that certainly whatever we do for November is not going to sit stand pat for the presidential primary. We know that that's going to be a bigger event, and we have to build towards that. But we want to build towards it on a solid foundation, not do something shaky, not do something that undermines uh, voter confidence or makes it so uh, inconvenient that nobody wants to avail themselves. I'm glad that you're looking at that district. Um, and, but it does, you know, the number seven train does go right down the middle of the 39th assembly district. So right. it should be able to locate somewhere where we can have that site. And, and so the, the other thing, and, and Ms. Sandow reminded me as well uh, that I, I didn't share, but it's, it's a point that needs to be made. Um, part of that PS money that we we're asking for requires us to have additional staffing. Every one of these jurisdictions that we spoke to has told us that we would be making a grave error if we attempted to run early voting out of the same unit that we run election day voting because the needs are divergent. One of the challenges that we also face, and, in, and we're going to overcome it in partnership with the council and the mayor's office as well, we presently don't have sufficient square footage in our borough offices to accommodate large numbers of you know, additional staff. We could probably have a Brooklyn were bursting at the seams. Queens, we probably could have fit a few people. But if we're going to have an early voting unit that is uh, going to meet the challenges of this process and be what we all demand it to be, uh, a top-notch unit, we need additional square footage uh, for people to sit. So it's one thing to identify the body and who's going to do the work. It's another thing to have a desk for them and a computer for them to work on. Uh, we all know that space, office space, OSHA, ADA compliant office space is at a premium in, in New York City. Uh, and the further challenge that we have is we would like to find it in locations that are sufficiently proximate to where we currently are uh, so that we're not engaging in, uh, you know, uh, inefficient staff allocation and, and, and create some problems with the, the management. So. That's another reason why we need to build. Are all of these um, early voting sites um, uh, uh, handicap accessible? Uh, the, the ones that we presently have on our list, yes. Okay. Uh, but like all of our poll sites, uh, we have, we're operating under a federal court uh, consent decree, so they would all have to be uh, evaluated. But, but this also, and, 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 and Councilman, we have some experience in this. We've made, uh, we made at least one decision uh, that you disagreed with in your, in your uh, district some years back, and you contacted us, and, and we worked with you to find a, a more suitable location. Mm -hmm. uh, we envision this process to be no different than that process. We're not all seeing, we're not all knowing, and you folks represent people and know your districts often better than, uh, than we do. So suggestions are, and communication are a wonderful thing. And I totally appreciate what you were able to, to do there with us working together on that. And I've always said that. Yes, so. I, I know. All right. Um, have you looked at using link kiosks to notify residents of early voting? Pardon? The link kiosks. Have uh, you looked at those to help advertise the fact that we well, now? That is not something that, uh, that, that we uh, specifically considered, but it's an interesting proposition because we already do have a good cooperative working relationship with 311. So that sounds to me like it would simply be an extension of our 311 relationship, uh, but we 
we are in the process of preparing a robust, and it's, it's in our testimony, a robust public education plan uh, like we did with the early, uh, with the rollout for the machines uh, in 2010, and, and some of the other stuff that we've been able to uh, uh, take a look at. We, we liked the ad campaign that was done on the flip the ballot mm -hmm. uh, when, uh, you know, that was, uh, that was done for the proposition questions on the back. So we're going to look at all of that, TV, radio, uh, certainly uh, if that can dovetail into our 311 conversations with relative ease, uh, that sounds like a good idea. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. Transportation hubs as well. Okay. Uh, like we've been advertising oh, for poll it? workers and interpreters so in the past. We're going to continue that with the early okay. voting. Okay. Uh, I'm going to let. I, you I have an adjustment to my testimony. Ms. Yes. Vasquez just whispered in my ear that she is waiting on a price quote for that, and it's already in her media plan. The link. So. Uh, uh, st as usual, staff is uh, further along than I am, uh, but that's good news uh, because we, we want to use all available means to effectively uh, communicate uh, with, with the voters, including expanding from our normal legal ads that nobody reads into the, the more of the neighborhood uh, and language-specific newspapers throughout the city uh, so that uh, everyone has the information they need to participate. Okay, good. I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Chair uh, Cabrera now because we've been going on for a while and uh, let him take, all, take over from here. Thank you so much. Uh, referring to the link, I've been informed that the links are free uh, for 5% of everything they put out is free for the city. I don't know how that applies to the Board of Election. Well, I, I think she was talking about the artwork and such necessary oh, the to, have, artwork. Right, to, you know, oh, to have okay. that. And so gotcha. the portal, I think, is free, but you still need to put up some content on there that looks kind of nice. That yeah, shouldn't be too expensive. <laughs> I mean, I could type it out if you'd like, but it yeah, probably I mean, would yeah, be we'll, so. We'll work on something. <laughs> uh, let me, uh, you know, I was just checking the Chicago, since you mentioned the other municipality, you mentioned Chicago. Uh, it was kind of interesting because in the, you know, they're very close to the amount of districts that they have, the common wards, and they have 50. 50 we have 51. But in every single one of them, for early voting, they have a site. Yes. Is that something, and they're much smaller than we are? What about the size of Brooklyn? Population-wise. So of Brooklyn. it would yeah. seem to me that if they been through this movie before, Right, they already been through uh, early voting. This, they saw that that it was wise to have one, at least one, on each of the wards. Doesn't it make sense? In a place where we're much larger, in a city that's much larger, that we should have at least one. So, for example, Vanessa Gibson's district, Councilmember Gibson. Uh, is one of the, you know, uh, lowest socioeconomic districts in the city. Uh, now we're asking people to go outside of that district and spend, you know, uh, you know, so financial hit that they're going to take to to go in early voting. So doesn't it make sense? If it makes sense for them, doesn't it make sense for us? Or so, and and Dawn could speak in in a, in a little bit more uh, detail on what she observed. There's a couple of. Uh, differences between us and Chicago. First of all, uh, Chicago started out with e poll books, right? Right. Sorry, right. With that, they sorry. started out with e poll books right out of the right out of the bat. Okay. Chicago also allows for their voting machines to be networked. We don't allow for our voting machines to be networked, so they're able to monitor from a central location. Uh, these machines, whether they're on, whether they're operating off of electric, whether they're operating uh, by battery, uh, all of those things can be monitored centrally. We can't do that. The other thing is their machine is purely touchscreen. It's not a paper ballot situation. So they have an ease of ballot delivery to their voters that we don't have. It will also be interesting to note uh, that the Congress right now is talking about uh, passing legislation that does away with purely touchscreen voting machines because of all of the cybersecurity concerns and the, f and the lack of a paper backup as, as, as not having a sufficient audit trail. Uh, so I don't know how that would impact uh, Chicago moving forward, but right now their voting system is different than ours. So, but regardless of what they're allowed to do or not allowed to do, okay, I, 
Can I just, it's, um, being yeah, that ahead, I Donna. went out to Chicago, um, if you, you can Google it, uh, but if you look at their first few years of implementation, um, and, and I have the articles, I can definitely email them to you. Um, there were lines and lines and lines of people. Um, was that because they, they were and, uh, about the project? And, uh, because the they bit off more than they can chew. And, and you know, it's not about... Well, wait, wait. How do you, how'd you come to that conclusion? It would seem to me that the reason there'll be lines and lines of people is because people got excited about just well, there like... Was, there was uh, issues with staffing, all the sites. Um, there were issues where they actually had to uh, postpone early voting. Um, they actually had to change legislation in the first three years of early voting um, because of the timing of the ballots. What Mike and I and the agency is trying to say is we can give you the 100 sites and we can throw everything out there. We're trying to do it in a way that we are successful and have a foundation so that there is not chaos at the polls. But I understand that you're saying that we need more sites, and we are actually looking. If we were doing just the minimum, we would be at 34 sites. We're at 38 and climbing. There, there are talks among, you know, uh, in, in each borough with elected officials. We're not sitting here saying this, this is 38 and that's all we're doing. We're trying to do it in a process that is going to enable our voters of the city of New York to have a good experience. That's what we're looking to do. And we're not saying that, okay, we're gonna wind up with 41 or 42 at the end of this election period, and that's what you're gonna have for the presidential primary. Yeah, we're not saying the, that either. Right. Uh, the, but, the primary but, is the Super Bowl, and we have to lead up to it. I hear you, but what I'm saying is this. This is all about leadership for me. When there's a failure in a poll site, it does not have an impact on another poll site. What happens in a poll site is because of management and stewardship issues. So if we have the right people doing the right operation, so what I... What I do I hear you saying is that we don't have sufficient trained people yet to be able to manage close to 100 sites. Is that what I hear you saying? It is a concern. That, that, is, is, that is a concern. And so poll worker recruitment is an issue in general. In a very, very small sampling going out on to the poll sites on Tuesday, it seemed that poll workers are interested in working more days. Uh, and so our fears might not be as, as bad as we, uh, you know, uh, as bad as we think, but we still have to go through the process of reaching out to our 42,000 poll workers find out how many of them will be available for nine or a portion of nine continuous days. All of that's a concern. And the other thing that we have been saying, and, and we're going to say it again, and now we're going from saying it to pleading for it. We need to get the municipal workers as poll workers process moving forward. It, it, we're beyond critical mass now. Yes. We've been hearing for, you know, for more than a decade about the union issues and, 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 and the challenges associated with that. And we've been good partners, you know, saying, okay, hope maybe next year, you know, kind of like the Brooklyn Dodgers, right? Wait till next year. Uh, and, and now we're at a point where we're going to ha be introducing technology into the poll sites in a way that's never been done before. Uh, and we're going to be doing a completely different way of conducting voting. We need this to happen. And, I, and we, I, I can't say it any more clearly. Yeah, and we have other council still with you in that issue, and, and we'll continue to do so, and uh, we'll continue to push. But here's the reality. The reality, if I could keep it real, is that few months after November, we're going to have the same issue at a level that we have never seen here, never a level that you have never managed before. So it would seem to me that it's better to, and we're going to have a lower, obviously, uh, 
uh, turnout in November. So it would seem to me I'd rather have 100 people, 100 sites, with uh, the people that you need out there uh, to do their job. They're going to work out through the king so they're prepared for the April one because that is going to be a huge operation. And I sympathize with the level of responsibility that has been given to you, but this is what you do. And so, so it, it was, doesn't it make more You're still going to have the same problem in April or next year. You're still going to have to do recruitment. You're still going to have to do training. It's better to have them train during a lower turnout month than it will be in April. Right. And as I said earlier in my testimony, it's sites. It's okay, so let's start. Let's go one at a time. So sites, the, the mayor put forth 200 and, and something. Uh, from what I've been told is those, those sites are ready to go. No, they're, they're not. They're not. How they're many not of those do you suspect they're not ready? Did you check all 220? Each borough is working on the list that was given to them. Um, we received the list after, of course, it was announced to the press, but we received the list later. Um, and then it was distributed to the borough offices who looked over the list. Uh, I can give you an example of one in the Bronx. There was Columbus High School. We sent our staff out to Columbus High School. Columbus High School now has benches inside the cafeteria. And now it is not the amount of square footage it was before. They gave us sites but they didn't give us sites that are ADA accessible for sure, or sites with the square footage that we need. So now, staff is going through every one of those sites. They are checking them. Um, but it wasn't a, here you go, everything is set. They're ready to go. They're going to be a pull site. And I appreciate that bit of information, because I did not know that you guys have you're going through an assessment oh, period absolutely. right now by when would you, when and by and when are you going to have being able to assess that how many of those are ready to go so i i can go back to each borough and we can get that information back to you as as a follow up as well what are you through. anticipating by when cuz i know you well, they're going through the list what i the, the the anecdotal feedback that i've gotten from the chiefs and deputies uh, and i we spoken to all the different counties is the overwhelming number of the sites are schools, and the overwhelming number of those schools are sites that we already use. So these are sites that we are familiar with, and some of them were dispositively crossed off the list because the s boroughs were familiar with them and knew that they didn't meet the needs based on the criteria that we have to follow. Keep in mind, it, I, I didn't mention it just for the sake of mentioning it. We have to keep these things in mind. State regs require one scanner for every 25,000 voters and one privacy booth for every 4,000 voters, right? Right. Um, Let's say that half of them do not seem feasible to use. And by the way, we're looking at a Gotham so, so I, uh, I article wanna, here. If I, I, if I may, Director, sure, I'm, just, I'm just trying to save time. I want to get to my colleagues. But this is really, really important. And maybe it's because my level of confidence of your ability to be able to do this. So uh, according to the Gotham uh, there, as a matter of fact, I could read this real quick, uh, that the Blasio administration believes that the number of early voting no, no, no. Instead, City Hall offered 222 locations. He said we're accessible and willing to host early voting uh, starting this November. The signs lean heavily on public partners like the Department of Education, NYSHA, along with several other public libraries. But you remember at the last hearing, and I keep saying this, that we need to go outside of also our public schools and mm -hmm. and that we need to offer them you know an, an, you know monetary incentive and the location we have plenty of look i don't think we don't have a site issue i think your biggest issue that i i'm feeling from this end coming from you is that i know you want to do it well and you want to do it with excellence i know that you don't want 
Let me keep it very real. You don't want the day after for us to come and say, how come you did not do this and, you know, this went this way and, and so forth. But what I'm saying here from this end is that my biggest fear is that we're going to have many people come out, including myself, I'm planning to vote early, that, and we are going to, all of the council members here, all our colleagues, not just in the council, every, it's, it's, there's going to be a buzz. And the worst thing that can happen is that we have a zillion of people coming out. We have, let's say you're up to 60, and I just don't believe that that might be enough. Uh, and at the same time, I, I think you have a grand opportunity to be able to train people. You're still going to need more people than ever, so it's a good pool to be able to draw people from for the April one. Already trained, that some of them could be the leadership. You will have an updraft of leadership. It's really about leadership at the end of the day. You're going to need an updraft of leadership for other post sites because you have a pool to draw from. Yes, provided that we have the people to do it. But if that you don't have it for now, I'm trying to help you here. Right, I understand. If you don't have it for now, I'm telling you, you're not going to have it for April. It, it, it's just, and I know you have a challenge to be able to pull people from, and, and we have to push for municipal workers to get engaged here. I know you're going to have a challenge, but this is the test to be able to say, all right, we'll do 100, Mr. Mayor. We'll do 100, Council. And we're going to try our best to get all that filled. And that's going to let us know the variables are not going to change for April. Are we going to be able to handle April? And if we're able to put the pressure that we need to get the municipal workers on board. Can I ask you a question? Sure. OK. Um, so if we have the 100 sites and we fall short of poll, poll workers, and now we have people waiting online because instead of having the 10 poll workers or 20 poll workers we're supposed to have in the site, we only have five. That's going to cause chaos. I, I, I understand what you're saying, that we, of course, you're thinking in your mind, well, if you can't get them now, what makes you think you could get them for April? Time. Time is what is making us think we could get them for April. Um, recruitment, um, working with the city council and the mayor, he wants to help. We have been asking for poll workers. This is going back to before I came to the board and I came in 2005. There's other jurisdiction, everybody's touting LA. LA has poll workers, municipal poll workers. All these other jurisdictions that everyone is looking to, they're, they're equipped in a sense where they're way ahead of us and they have the ability to have municipal poll workers, and they have their police officers, like in LA, coming in by helicopter with ballots. You know, things are made quite a, a, a lot easier, and I'm not saying we have it hard, I'm not complaining, mm -hmm. but I'm saying we're trying to do it, and we're trying to do it the right way, and we're trying to go by experience from other jurisdictions. Uh, we took the time to sit down and have conference calls with seven other jurisdictions. And everyone said the same thing. Dip your toe in the water. Go in slow. We would love to be able to sit here and say, we're going to give you the hundred. We would love to be able to do that. But we can't promise you that they're going to be filled with poll workers. We can't promise that. And I personally, you're, now you're asking people to work not nine days because they have to come the day before and do a trial run, so 10 days straight. Well, do they have to work all 10 days? No, oh, but, you can but this is one of the challenges right. that we're trying to figure out. Right. The, 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 and to but I agree with you, Don, because uh, you asked me a question. Yeah, Normally, we're the ones happened? asking questions. But, but what, to, what to, 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 what is the council yeah, to, But to answer your question, basically, you are What's the council going to say to us when, we should, when, when there's chaos because there's not enough poll workers in the sites? What, how are we going to be received? I, my inclination is that you will have 
enough people out there who are interested. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to embed on That's that. That's also going to help us to recruit these poll workers? Well, I, I think we all need to be definitely engaged. Uh, I think that uh, one thing that you could do now is to do a survey with the with the poll workers right now and ask them now, how many of you be willing, and that will give you good stats. Regardless of the outcome of that survey, you're going to have data. If it's not, if we don't have enough, then that's data to say we need municipal workers. And that makes your argument even stronger. Okay, that's great. And if it is, then you can say, hey, we're ready. I have more questions, but I know my colleagues are I, I just have dying one more question. To so if we move forward, and we are, have already started doing our surveys and sending out our letters to see who's available um, of our pool, and we don't have 37,000 in a pool, but we, we have about 28, 29,000. Um, these are the people that work for us on election day. Um, so if it comes back that we don't have enough for 100 sites, are we getting a guarantee from the city council that they're going to help us fill? Hey, you know what, Don, 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 that's exactly what I'm saying. Again, I'm trying to help you. Okay. Which is, now you have the argument to say to the city, we need, we're beyond need for the municipal workers. But you need that data, because right now, to be honest with you, we're speculating, we're assuming, and assumption is the lowest form of knowledge. I'm trying to opt the knowledge level here through data so we can make a better decision. I, so, I have this thing about letting my colleagues right. get involved here because I know they've been waiting for a long time, so I'm going to pass it along to my co-chair, but I'll come back. I have more questions. Okay, we've been joined by Majority Leader Cumbo and Council Member Joe Nye has questions. Thank you, Chairs. That was really um, interesting. I have a straightforward question. Do you feel that this is a setup for you to get a black eye because there's no way you're going to be able to deliver? No, what I, what I think is that there was um, an appetite that was, was brewing in the state legislature for many years uh, to have New York join many other jurisdictions uh, and, and do early voting. Uh, at some point, you have to do it, and you, and you have to move forward, and that's what we're doing. What we're, but having, this sounds what we're having difficulty with is, and, and I want everybody to understand this, Presently, there is no infrastructure in place to do early voting in New York City. We're building this house from the ground up. So we have to build the house, and we have to find out who the occupants of that house are going to be. So we're trying to do it in a step-by-step, -step, reasonable, and measured way, because the timing of it really put us up against uh, you know, the wall. March the 15th, we had to designate the poll sites within f six weeks of the, the statute passage. May the 1st, we had to announce, oh, by the way, we were f in the middle of certifying an election that was a citywide election and had to prepare for another small election event. W we're trying to juggle all of these balls simultaneously, not drop any of them, right? And then once we put out the sites that we're going to use for, election for early voting, there is nothing that prevents us from building on that. No one's going to object if we do more. What we were concerned about was, what if we can't staff the sites that we have and we've, we've overcommitted and now we can't pull back because we made a statutory designation by May the 1st. So yes, some of it was uh, protective of the agency and its reputation, but more than that, it was to meet the legal requirements that was set uh, by the state legislature. So if we're at a lower number and we build, we're safe. If we're at a higher number and we can't meet that standard, then we have to pull back and we're not safe. Now we're in violation of law what because will it take of the May 1st for this to be convenient, reliable, accessible, and less, the least amount of disruption in particular our schools, which I am completely opposed to. The threat of 50 days will have our administrators in our local schools up in arms. That is a non-starter. So it sounds like, is it time or is it money? Or is it both? It's, all, check all of the boxes. It's time. 
its suitable locations. And, and No, it's mean, time for you to do this right, meaning convenient, reliable, um, and less disruptive. And in the New York second, because that's how we want things. Right. It's, primarily, it's time. I think that the resources are ultimately, the financial resources are ultimately going to be there. Uh, but we're trying to build something that has never been done. No other jurisdiction has had to do five counties simultaneously. Chicago is a single county jurisdiction. LA is big, but it's also a single county jurisdiction. Uh, so it operates under one umbrella. We, we have now the state I'm, that we I'm have optimistic. to answer to you guys. I know you're optimistic. You've got the right. talent. We've got the bodies. We've got the knowledge. How do we get this done? My follow-up to that was I want to make sure that I give everyone else a chance to speak. What are the, what are the pay, what, what are the poll workers receiving? The poll as, workers, the coordinators receive $350 a day, and the poll workers receive $250 a day. What is the average day on election day? Well, uh, How many the hours early voting days would be shorter, to? but the average election day is about 15 to 16 hours. So that breaks down to 15 hours. <laughs> so I, I always bring my calculator. $20 an hour? No, less. It's on a regular election day uh, at 250 it's about 16 Seventeen dollars an hour, depending now, on how. I don't imagine work. you're having people line up to make sixteen dollars an hour, so they can work these long days and get up at three o'clock in the morning and stay there till nine p.m. and then wait to be told they're clear to go home. That's correct. So let's call it what it is. It's a budget problem. If you doubled that salary, I would imagine you'd have quite a few people out there that would be interested in saying, you know what, I can make five hundred dollars a day. I would be interested. The, the board has consistently... No, I may uh, take a day right. off. I don't make that much. No, it's... A, it's a <laughs> but the board consistently he has asked for, uh, and, and it's actually since before I became the executive director, which is almost six years, we wanted uh, at least $400 for coordinators and $300 for poll workers. What's that dollar amount? Pardon? What's the dollar amount? Uh, total? $400 total. Um, it's... For the, our total for poll workers, say 300, uh, times it by 32,000, uh, it's almost $10 million, $9.6 million. We're negotiating for, election, for a citywide election event. Citywide. Right. Okay. So, and it will be a lot less for a special election, correct. right? So in a 90 plus billion dollar budget, we can't find $10 million? Is that what we're saying? Well, and I'm going to point to my chairs on this. I, like, like I this said, is what we've been fighting for for years, and talking about early voting and opportunities and what New Yorkers are entitled to, and the democracy that's supposed to be so readily available and transparent. It's $10 million. Let's do this. I can't imagine why we won't. Is that a state? Uh, says the amount, right? Actually, New York City pays the poll workers more uh, than the state mandate. Um, what we have now is by mayor's executive order. So recent, up until recently, they were at 200 and 300 for coordinators. We asked for 400 and 300. We got 250 and 350. Which was a step in the right direction, but still, uh, I believe, as uh, Councilman Joe and I is, is, is saying, that there's still room or meat on this bone that we is can... Is that uh, something that you're asking based on what my colleague is suggesting? Is that something that will be an incentive that we should be pursuing? And any, be in the anything that we can do that will expand the pool of individuals that would be willing to work on Election Day will be wonderful. I can share a moment, uh, some feedback. I literally got five minutes and it's hard for me to speak in five minutes. I got five minutes to, to address the UFT retirees last week. Uh, and there seemed to be some uh, excitement amongst the, the retired teachers to, to be willing to be uh, poll workers. Uh, and I explained to them that there was more opportunity because of the extended days, and they, and they seemed to be uh, willing to work. But certainly, um, if you put a little bit uh, more of an incentive out there, uh, then I think that that will help in the recruitment efforts without question. I just want to make but note just, as yeah, well I, that taxes are taken out. I just thought of something else. Does never that done dollar amount, if we multiply that, will that hurt some of the potential poll workers uh, that may exceed a threshold? Y which yes. could be another problem that they may not want to make possibly a few dollars over 
a threshold to avoid losing programming and other entitlements. Right. So, so what happened was uh, a number of years ago, uh, I, I believe Dawn said it might have been as early back as 2010 or 2009, uh, the IRS enforced a regulation that requires the board of, boards of elections, not just us, everybody, to treat their poll workers as employees. So we have, say, 32,000 for, for a, an election. We have to put them on the books and take them off the books. And for that $250 that we're paying them, or 350 taxes are being uh, taken out of them based on how they fill out their W-9. So um, it, it, it's a challenge. You, you know, and you talk to these folks. I, I remember a few years back, um, we had an issue when they were processing raises, and there was a, uh, a freeze on processing uh, poll worker payroll for workers that had prior city service. And it had to do with FISA and OMB and processing and OLR processing uh, the raises. Dawn, not me, Dawn specifically grabbed the bull by the horn. She had people calling her in tears in advance of Christmas because their poll worker checks a few were being held up uh, because of this issue with the uh, city ID number. Uh, and she was able to, on a case-by-case -case basis, get them their checks processed. These people use it almost like a Christmas club, uh, you know, a way to, uh, to, 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 to provide for their families, you know, around the holidays. And it's, it's a tough thing when you see people uh, that really did the work and are in a desperate situation. If we could treat them better, certainly it would be a good thing. So I, I just want to hit on that one, one issue, too, that you brought up about them going over the mark. Um, that's a concern for us because now it's not where they're going to be working two elections. Now we're going to be asking them to work three and four or, or five days, six days, and they don't want to go. The seniors can't go over. Some of them can't go over the mark. We're really trying to target college kids. We're trying to get the younger generation in there to come in and work the polls. Not that we want to do away with the seniors. We don't. We want the seniors. But they can only work a certain amount of days before it hurts their, you know. Could this be a paid internship? Can we, we look at it in that, that regard? And maybe that would be a way to circumvent the hurdles that you have? A, our, our uh, especially our high school, well, high school may be too young, but our college students well, we, we do who have, have, to a, do community, have to do community, have to do community service, that we can make this part of their curriculum, and that's something we have to think about, but certainly can, you can use the money and the extra credit for graduating. We've, we've done this with the high school students. Um, Queens has a great success. That's 50 days. Yes. And it's another concern. How many days can we get them out of class? Right. And right. But, but the, other, the other side of it, though, is it's 50 days total, but we also have uh, weekend time available for the first time on Saturdays and right. Sundays, which we didn't have before. before. So yeah. to, to your point earlier, Mr. Chairman, yes, we anticipate having to do a mix and match. It's not you're going to work all 10 days right. or you're not, in the, you're not on the list. You know, we're going to try to get as much continuity as we can, uh, but recognizing that, uh, you know, the administrative side of it's going to go up a little bit for right. us, but we have to be able to staff it. My last question is you brought up this uh, early voting, um, the translation, the printer factor. You're welcome to a help center. They're going to be able to print for you your unique re uh, voter uh, registration form. The ballot. The ballot right. itself, depending on your the area that you can vote in. Can we also have that, what's the time frame for us? So what's the expectation? Is it a three second delay by the time I check in with you? It comes out of the printer. How many printers are you going to have? What if they fail? Right, so. Um, is it gonna be hardwired? Is it gonna be wireless? I'm concerned about, based on what we experienced in many elections, the unexpected, Murphy's Law. Right. Whatever can go wrong, will go wrong. Right. What happens then? That's Should I yell at you today for what's going to happen in the future? Because <laughs> I certainly expect major complications. Right, so there's a, there's a few things going on with that. Right now there's a push, particularly from some of the smaller counties, to ask the state legislature to do away with the color requirements for uh, primary ballots because then we would be able to use black and white only printers and that would be uh, less of an issue. Uh, our current plan in our heads, at least anyway, before we engage the tech folks 
is to have uh, two check-in stations uh, for each printer and to do 20 check-in stations and 10 printers for each early voting site uh, so that you would really overbuild it. Uh, but if you've ever stood in front of your office printer waiting for something to come out, when you're a little bit impatient, it doesn't seem to print as quickly as you want it to when you're in a rush, right? So they, they print fairly quickly. Uh, they say 15, 20 seconds, but you're talking about in New York City mostly going to be around a 19-inch page, uh, and it's going it's to take some time. Uh, but uh, that's why we're going to do the two-for-one, and we're going to have people at the back but while we're at it, and I think length of paper is going to be a problem, depending on the number, is there going to... We should be okay with the length, of, the length of paper. So when you're walking in, there's going to be a greeter. We're going to have people greeting them as they're walking in. So they're going to be, there's going to be an electronic... Could you turn your mic on, please? I'm sorry. Thank you. An electronic pulpit with two teams, and behind that team is a BOD. So when the voter comes, the voter check-in will go a lot smoother, a lot quicker, we're hoping. Um, and the voter signs a receipt comes out of the electronic poll book and also that gets tr transmitted directly to the ballot mo the uh, ballot on demand system so if i got creative can we also have language uh, translators for these documents i mean they're being printed out is there a possibility we can start working on this now or it can be done in a language that the voter prefers? So, That's down the road. Uh, that question. certainly uh, would be a down the road consideration, but in the short term, in the jurisdictions, uh, you know, the Bronx is English and Spanish, so the ballots will be printed in English and Spanish. Uh, Manhattan has uh, English, Spanish, uh, and Chinese in some, uh, in some EDs. Brooklyn, the same. Uh, Staten Island is English and Spanish, and Queens has some jurisdictions that require five languages, English, uh, Spanish, Chinese, Korean, and Bengali. So the ballot on demand systems will be able to replicate the ballots the same way that we get them from the printer. So you would get the ballot in uh, your choice of language if it's one of the covered languages that we presently uh, service. Thank you. Now, don't forget that we, we have to roll this out for early voting, but we also have to roll out electronic poll books for election, to, for election day to 37,000 poll workers. So 37,000 poll workers rolling out a new, a new electronic device for them, training them, and getting this done, because let's not forget, we, we have election day as well. Everybody's right. focusing on early voting, yes, but there's election day that we have to focus on. Also testing. We have to test all those scanners, our VMTs, which are limited, which we need an increase in, most definitely. They have to test all the scanners and the BMDs that are going out for early voting while they are also preparing for election day. And that's a lot more scanners that are going out and BMDs. So Chair, the, the last question I have, that 220 proposed sites so we have a better understanding. Can we actually request that list with an explanation to which qualify and which don't, and for the reason they don't, so we're better informed? We're getting questions already within our districts as to why so few voting possible state we can ask him, sites. We can ask the administration. Yeah. And we would actually be able to hit back and say, well, here's why. Yeah. Transportation, square footage, accessibility, and all the other components. Mr. Councilman, we, we have uh, the spreadsheet from the administration. What we don't have is that other information that you're asking for, the methodology that was used uh, to suggest those sites. How so, long before you can get an explanation for each one of those sites that don't qualify or that according to your requirements? Well, our borough offices are, are in the process of doing that. I can get you an answer to that, uh, you know, early next week. But, but if, you, if you want, if you simply want the list. No, no, the I list want the is, list with your explanation right, as to why they don't qualify or they don't meet the criteria and it should be sent right. to Got the it. chairs. Okay, thank you. <coughs> All right, we're going to go to Chair Cabrera, who's going to take us out because we have um, another hearing, uh, which we're already late on starting. As a matter of fact, this is the only hearing we had today. We were late. All the other ones we finished early. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, That's because we love them very much. Well, you, yeah, said, we, you said we, we were your favorite. Yes. <laughs> oh, no, most interesting. I'm sorry. Uh, you, uh, I didn't want to put words in your mouth. I know you love, I know you love coming here. I know you love it. 
Um, but I have to say, today was the first day that we got to hear your fears. And where the fears, we heard your fears before, but I got to hear where they're stemming from. And I think it's very important to vocalize and to share that. I, last questions, um, two qu quick questions, and that is, um, how would the BOE train poll workers to verify voter uh, identity with poll books? Can, they, can you do this with existing resources? And very important to me, what levels of cybersecurity have been implemented to prevent any personally identify information being taken from electronic poll books. So with respect to the training, uh, the vendors, I, I suspect, that make the final cut off the state list have all indicated that they have robust implementation plans because uh, they have expressed to us that if we fail, they fail, and that they have training uh, programs, they can make the adjustments that we need made for our particular jurisdiction, but that they can assist us and provide the uh, staffing necessary to get that training done, because we're not experts in those devices either. Uh, so that's one thing. And the other thing is um, the State Board of Elections, in its criteria, uh, has included uh, cybersecurity elements within that. So any of the vendors that we end up using will have passed uh, the state's uh, cybersecurity uh, mandates. Uh, so then buttoning it into our system, then we work not only with our own internal cyber folks, but we also work very closely with our outside vendors that provide us uh, cybersecurity oversight, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and the city's cyber command. So all of these pieces will come together. And, and the other piece of it, I don't think that we've ever discussed, but a couple of years, about a year and a half ago, the federal government declared elections systems critical infrastructure. And there is an elections system, uh, election infrastructure uh, group that is nationwide. Uh, and so that there's standards that they set as well uh, to make sure that all of the jurisdictions are operating at a, at a good level. But is there any, and this last question related to this, is there an independent group that gets higher company to verify whatever they're claiming? Because, I mean, a company can yes. say, we have this. We okay. use, uh, off, we have leveraged uh, a, a, a cyber command contract, but we're the contract manager with FireEye Mandiant. Uh, they've had Defense Department contracts, et cetera. They're one of the leaders in the industry. The city has provided that for us. Uh, and uh, they, they, get, they get paid a, a good chunk of change every year, but they, but they do a good job. And they are our 365 day a year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, overseer, uh, and, they, and they, they monitor. But in our budget testimony is our desire to create a more robust cybersecurity team, uh, you know, internal to the Board of Elections, so that we're, we're closing whatever uh, gaps there may be on the, on the overnight in particular, and to have the individual borough offices uh, have uh, cybersecurity folks uh, on staff on site. Especially now with the electronic poll books. We yeah, I'm happy to hear that in light of what happened in Florida. We got limited information. Uh, the, you know, the Russians got into two systems. The FBI don't want to get more information, but that's two that we know of. So uh, I'm happy to hear that. With that, I'll turn it back to the Okay. Chair. We do have one last question from Councilmember Kalos. Uh, I think I have to go back to the office. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to thank the finance chair and the GovOps chair for their indulgence. I'll make this very, very quick. Uh, are you aware of any possible vulnerabilities with a hybrid paper-based system wherein when a paper ballot is cast, it must go past a printing mechanism where additional votes could be added to an undervoted ballot? My understanding, and I'm not a techie, and we've had this conversation, Councilman, so uh, excuse me if I have limited information. Every paper-based voting system, every single one, operates off of some type of barcode system, everyone. So, uh, for example, the current system that we have right now, much perhaps to your chagrin, the system doesn't recognize Ben Kalos when Ben Kalos, ben Kalos is on the ballot. The system recognizes an oval at a particular location. 
I'm okay. in the pay fat. Right? So what happens is, but just so you understand, let, let me the media. Let me put my thing in language. So right? one model is you take a piece of paper, you mark it by hand, and Correct. you feed it into a machine. That machine doesn't have a print head in it, so it can't do anything with the vote other than scan it. Another model is that the printer gets a piece of paper that you put into it, and then the printer then adds what should be on your ballot and then casts your vote from the same mechanism. Right. So in between casting the vote and the ballot box is a print head. So I, I guess what I'm, what I'm saying is any system, uh, and I'm not endorsing one or the other, we, we deal with whatever the State Board of Elections tells us are the machines we could use. Um, what makes our system work is not the read head and it's not the oval. It's the setup on the medium that, that the flash drive is giving the scanner the instruction on how to interpret a piece of information. And that's all these machines do. So the vulnerability is in the setup, not in the physical uh, action of a particular machine. If that medium is not set up properly, then those votes won't tally properly. But and that having been said, that having been said, New York State has the most robust um, post-election canvas process to verify that the machines are working properly. And we are in the process of hopefully uh, finalizing a contract where we can uh, do that with an independent auditing uh, system so that we have confidence that all of that uh, is, is done across the board for all ballots cast, as opposed to limiting it to the 3% the audit that we presently do. I'm at time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I want to say we were also joined by Councilmember Gibson. And uh, with that, we thank you for coming in, and uh, we look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you very much. And we'll take a five-minute break, and then we will have the Campaign Finance Board. I didn't even take any water. The answer to that question is, there's no printer head in the DS-200, oh, and the ballots are cast in the DS-200, right. but they're being printed on a, a, an independent. Right, I understand. Okay, but he's asking right. a question saying, Different. There's, two mach there's one machine printing in ballots. Sorry, Howie. Sorry, how are you? No, Sorry how are you? about that. No, it's okay. Well, Sean Crowley's gonna be very mad. Sorry, Sean. Good, somebody should be mad at you. Um, can I? I'm tired of being the only person that people are mad at. <laughs> Is that possible? Because they're going to... Yeah, can we just go on? Sorry, I hate to do it. Uh, just let me say my goodbyes. Hi, how are you today? It's Friday. Can't be here tomorrow. Are these yours? No, those are not mine. 222. Hey, it's Vanessa. Did you call me? Oh, I must have butt dialed you. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably. So we're on for eight tomorrow? Okay. Hi, how are you? Good to see you today. Good to see you. Um, Okay, that's fine. I'm gonna do the PayPal now because I have a little bit of a uh, time before my hearing. But yeah, because I really need to get out of there. I've got Saturday, and, and tomorrow's the Bronx Bowl. There's a ton of stuff we're doing in the Bronx, so I gotta be up at like what should be by six, and I have an event in the question. middle of the day. And most importantly, I gotta be in Midtown by 11:30. So if I come there by eight, I should be done by like 10:30, right? Yeah, but no, the only thing is I need, I haven't had my hair washed at all or rebraided. I need all that stuff done too. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. All right. Okay. I, so are we going to do a swap? The one I have now, hi, how are you? The one I have now, I'm giving back to you and you're going to replace it, right? Okay. All right. No problem. And is there any way, um, 
I, you how, know, I like how, the brown the and the hair, the, the, the unit is dark. It's not like a jet black, but it's still black. Is there any way, we don't have to do it now, but maybe the next time, can I get it like dyed or something so it can be more brown? Okay, cool. All right. Yep, I'll be there. I'll be there. Thanks. Okay. All right. Have a good day. Thanks. You too. Bye.
Veterans Commission meetings, and you, it sounds like the staff are preparing a report related to online voter registration. Yes. Would it be possible? I know that you don't... Online usually, voter registration? Yeah, the bill that we passed, I believe there's a staff report that you're preparing to say how you will kind of work with the CFB or not about implementation. Yeah, well, the, the issue is, and everybody seems to forget, the issue is... It the passed state. in the state. It did pass in the right. state. And so that's we're kind of what we're to trying go. to figure uh, out. We will be ready to go with online photo reg. We have our MIS department already moving with our system to handle it. I think, are you talking about CFB and we're then to the digital CFB signal? We're trying to figure out what CFB can do. And so I know that the staff report is being prepared by the Board of Elections. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible for us to see it on Tuesday? Yeah. Or before yes. Tuesday? I can yeah. reach out I to Mike and give a phone call. But I didn't. I didn't. Sergeant Navarro, we're ready. Okay, we will now resume the City Council's hearing on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. The Finance Committee is joined by the Committee on Governmental Operations, chaired by Councilmember Fernando Cabrera. Uh, we're joined by Councilmember Ben Kalos. We just heard from the Board of Elections, and now we'll hear from the Executive Director of the Campaign Finance Board, Amy Lowprest. In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement. But before we hear testimony, I will open the mic to my co-chair, Councilmember Cabrera. Thank you so much, uh, co-chair, and thank you for the wonderful job you have done since early this morning. Now I would like to welcome Amy Lopez, Executive Director for the Campaign Finance Board, Rick Schaefer, CFB's Chair. Thank you for testifying before us today. The CFB 2020 Executive Budget totals $28.1 million, including $12.4 million in personnel services, funding to support 121 full-time positions. The CFB is a nonpartisan, independent city agency that administers the matching funds program in city elections by matching private donation with public funds. To increase transparency, the CFB also publishes detailed public information about the money raised and, and spent in city election by participating and non-participating candidates. The committee would like to hear from the CFE about the financial impact of ballot proposal one, which was approved by voters in the 2018 general election, and which, among other changes to our charter, increased the public match participating candidates can receive and raise the cap on the total funds a participating candidate may receive per election. The committee would like to hear about the CFB staffing needs as it is prepared for oncoming elections. And with that, I'll turn it back to my co-chair. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask counsel to swear the panel in. Okay. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. You may proceed. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Cabrera, and Chair Drum, and members of the Committee on Governmental Operations and Finance. My name is Amy Loprest, and I'm the Executive Director of the New York City Campaign Finance Board. With me is Board Chair Frederick Schaefer. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on the CFB's budget for fiscal year 2020 and to answer any questions you might have. This last year has been an active one for the CFB. This includes a February special election for public advocate, as well as a special election this past Tuesday for City Council District 45. We have also seen the matching funds program undergo significant changes during the past year, which we will address later in the testimony. We are now looking ahead to an even busier election calendar, and accordingly, part of this year's budget includes our voter engagement efforts for the 2020 presidential, federal, and state elections. We are also preparing for the 2021 citywide elections. 2021 will be the largest election cycle the CFB has ever seen in its 30-year history. By 2021, 42 current office holders will be term limited. Consequently, we are expecting as many as 500 candidates to appear on a primary or general election ballot in 2021. The volume of expected candidates in the earlier election calendar will require us to begin hiring and training additional staff during the next fiscal year. Before I get into the specifics of this year's budget, I'd like to discuss some of the program changes has, the program has gone, undergone the past year. As mentioned, the legal framework for the matching funds program has been transformed over the past 12 months. 
The first of three charter revision proposals approved by voters in November 2018 made multiple changes to the program aimed at encouraging more candidates to build viable campaigns for office, especially citywide office, that are fueled by small dollar contributions rather than large contributions. First, the matching rate was increased from six to, six to one to eight to one for candidates seeking citywide office. The program will match the first $250 from New York City residents instead of 175 that applies to all other candidates. Along with the increased matching rate, contribution limits were lowered for all offices. Additionally, candidates running in 2021 will be able to choose between the six to one or eight to one systems and their respective contribution limits. Furthermore, the Charter Revision Commission increased the amount of public funds available from 55% of the spending limit to 75% and required the CFB to make matching funds available to candidates starting in February of the election year. Initially, these changes were put forth by the Charter Revision Commission were set to take effect with the 2021 elections to allow CFB staff to prepare thoroughly for implementation of these significant changes to the program. Local Law 1 of 2019, sponsored by Councilmember Benjamin Kalis, put these changes in place for the February special election for public advocate, as well as all elections leading up to 2021. Ultimately, the board paid $7.2 million in matching funds to 11 candidates for that the public advocate special election, all but one of whom chose the new 8 to 1 system. Recent changes in the state election law also require us to take action earlier than in previous years. With the consolidated primary election date now in June, part of this year's budget reflects our ongoing preparations to accommodate an earlier election cycle. As we analyze the impact of these changes and assess the substantial administrative work that will be required to implement them, we are continuing to perform our audits for campaigns from the 2017 election cycle. <coughs> Excuse me. Our improved audit process is already yielding results more efficiently. To date, we've completed 35% of all audits for candidates in 2017 elections. For reference, at this point in 2015, we had completed 19% of the audits for the 2013 elections. The fifth CFB's budget for the fiscal year 2020 that was submitted to the mayor and included in his executive budget is $28 million. Since we submitted this budget to the mayor and in preparing for this testimony, we have identified approximately $500,000 in OTPS costs that can be eliminated. This is from a combination of delaying some projects and proactively looking for cost reductions. The largest increase in this year's budget is due to our citywide print voter guide for this year's general election, which is expected to include ballot proposals from the 2019 Charter Revision Commission. We have also budgeted for a potential print guide for the June primary election next year. This funding will also cover a robust citywide advertising campaign for the voter guide. Additionally, we will publish an online voter guide for the 2020 presidential, federal, and state primary races. We're also including $250,000 for upgrades to the voter guide submission application in order to streamline and improve the user experience for candidates submitting their profiles for the voter guide. As we continue to seek ways to better engage New Yorkers with limited English proficiency in our elections, we have allocated $570,000 in our budget for translation services to make our materials available to more New Yorkers in a broader range of languages. This budget also includes unavoidable increases, including $300,000 for an anticipated rent increase, Personnel cost increase, increases reflect salary increases from new union contracts and longevity increases. As mentioned earlier, the program has undergone a number of changes in the past year, even as we begin pre preparations for the largest election our program has ever seen. It is inevitable that the workload will increase and our additional staff will be necessary to meet the demands of the 2021 elections. The fiscal year 2020 budget includes new staff to help administer the program, specifically in candidate guidance, which will help more candidates navigate the program efficiently, audit, and document processing. We will also be converting some of our existing system staff from the seasonal roles to permanent lines. This will help implement legislative changes over the past year that will require changes to our systems and overhauls of our internal software. Given the historic volumes of candidates we expect for the 2020 elections, we want to ensure that we are taking every administrative step to make the process as smooth as possible for candidates. 
Before concluding, I would like to draw your attention to our 2018-2019 voter analysis report, which was delivered to all members of the City Council at the end of April. The report highlights our ongoing efforts to increase turnout in New York City, as well as an in-depth analysis of the turnout and registration rates across the city. Our founding in this report will serve as a basis for our outreach moving forward. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and we're happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, Ms. Lowprest. I just have a couple of questions for you. Sure. The first one regards campaign matching funds program. So as provided by ballot proposal one, approved by city voters in the 2018 general election, the private donations a candidate receives will be matched eight to one instead of six to one, up to a maximum donation of $250. Do you anticipate candidates will still opt to use the old six to one ratio rather than the new eight to one? as permitted prior to the 2021 primary? Um, it's hard to know what people are going to opt, but the experience in the two special elections that have happened that people had the option, the vast majority of candidates opted into the new program. Um, the information we have to date, candidates don't have to make their option decision until later this year, but the majority of candidates have opted toward for option A. Okay, the, thank you. The, the new program. <laughs> Um, what impact will this change have on, on, on your campaign matching funds program? Do you anticipate having to put out more, or is it equal? It's terms as the spending. The spending. Um, we anticipate that this will be an increase. Will cause will um, will be an increase in the uh, when we testified before the Charter Revision Commission. We estimated that the uh, increase that that they were proposing would be about a 47 percent increase in public funds. Okay. Thank you. And uh, state election law reform. Uh, will the New York State uh, will the New York State legislators recently did action to consolidate local, state, and federal primaries to a single date in June have an impact on the administration of the city's campaign finance system? And are there new resor resources needed for the timelines now that the timelines have shifted? Um, uh, they certainly will have an effect. Um, again, it's sometimes it's hard. It's somewhat hard to predict what the exact effect of having the earlier primary will on campaigns, the way campaigns are run. Um, but certainly, as far as the impact on our budget, we are starting earlier. So, I mean, whereas this fiscal year in an election, in a year that where there was a September primary, we probably wouldn't be anticipating hiring additional staff this year because the primary is in June, because we anticipate um, those early payments as early as February, uh, <clears throat> that we are going to have to start hiring staff and training them so that we are ready for the, the increased activity earlier in the election cycle. And um, for 2021, the primary will be in June for City Council? Yes. Okay, and then um, is there a, um, an election two years after that for City Council? Yes. And then the following would be for four years after that? Two years after that. Two so years 2021, after that. 2023, 2023, and 2025. Okay, so that's similar to um, what happened in 2001. It happens every 20 years because it's for the redistricting um, for the City Council for um, after the census. Okay, good. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to Chair Cabrera. I only have a few questions. Uh, thank you, Co-Chair. Uh, how many CFB staff are in the agency's IT division or have information technology uh, as a substantive uh, portion of their day uh, to day job? Um, so there are 34 employees in our that in our systems division. Uh, the vast majority of them are developers, but there are people who also do the networking, IT, and people who are analysts. So, what percentage of full-time CFB you would say fall into this category? What's the? Um, you're going to make me do math. You always make <laughs> me do math. Um, <laughs> the, uh, it's uh, 34 out of the 130 employees. So, I guess it's about. That should be relatively easy, so it's like a third? Is that a right? Third? My bad. Less than a third. That's pretty high. Is there, is there, well, what would be the reason for, again, I, I mean, if you could be more specific, that's pretty high, right, don't you think? Um, the total? Well, they, we have, so we have a, a 
I think about seven or eight interlocking internal and external systems that provide you know, the, the software we, we've developed in-house, the software that candidates use, the NYC Votes Contribute application that provide candidates the facility to take contributions uh, for the credit card over the internet. Um, we have our internal databases that our auditors used and all of the staff used to perform the work to review all of the candidate submissions. Um, this, one of the reasons we're staffing up is because we are in the process of replacing or updating an antiquated back-end database system. It, it was the database that was created in 1989. Wow. And I mean, it was updated in 93 to be a network base from a mainframe. But I mean, it, the infrastructure needs to be, um, very much needs to be updated. And the part of that update will uh, result in a number of efficiencies for the, the audit staff, for the rest of the staff. Hopefully, the, the, the goal is that the audit staff will be able to perform the reviews at 50% faster after this new, uh, uh, more modern database is created. I would have to ask my colleague, Ben Kellos, in 1989, that's where they had the 46 computers. I said, that's, that's how far back. I mean, that's a long time ago. 386. 386. Wow. That's, it's been a long time. Why did it take so long? I mean, since well, I mean, it's, I mean, it's not been static <laughs> since 1989. Right. But it, I mean, the, the, and also it was updated. That was a, the 1989 system was a mainframe, and it was updated to be a network uh, in the 90s. But it's been added on to and changed. And as we built all these other systems in the, the early part of the program, people filed on paper. You know. You know, gotcha. had to fill out their forms on paper. We created a system that you could file with a diskette. Now you can file, you know, online. It's, you know, there's been upgrades all along, but it's, this is, you know, now the, having the time and taking to rebuild the entire infrastructure is a complicated process. Are these temporary hires uh, related to your ongoing C, uh, CSMART overhaul? And if so, how many of these positions will disappear around the overhaul? The, uh, the, the idea is that after this overhaul, which is going to take you know a number of years, the, um, through attrition, the, you know we will reduce the number of people. Okay, thank you. I'm easy today, very easy. <laughs> Let me turn it back to uh, my co-chair. Thank okay. you. And we have questions from Councilmember Kalos. Good afternoon. How are you? Okay. I uh, see f how many of the candidates in the special election for District 45 made uh, public matching? Um, I think that all but two, but I'm trying to remember how many people it was. It was six candidates uh, received public funds. And the other ones that didn't make it didn't even make the threshold at all. So there, were, there was one that ceased their campaign after raising $4,000 and two that did not actually even raise more than $2,000. Yeah, I mean, the other people didn't meet the threshold, yes. Okay. Uh, in a previous hearing, one of the concerns that was brought up was about uh, candidates finding it difficult to make matching to have their contributions counted and just uh, some of the issues with uh, the NYC votes platform. Uh, what, what is your plan Moving forward, I, I understand one of the people who came, Dawn Small, said that she actually had a previous uh, CFB employee who, who actually uh, did candidate services on my race uh, and actually even fixed my bike once uh, at a, a New York City Century. But what types of uh, programs are you rolling out to help candidates with compliance? And, and uh, see that I have a clock, so I guess the other uh, question that I had is relating to the voter guide. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. As a constituent, the voter guide tends to have one or tends to have, I believe, two versions per borough. And uh, in so doing, you end up with a list of like four or five candidates in Manhattan, and then you have to know which one of the candidates is your candidate in order to engage it, which can be confusing. Uh, is there additional funding being requested at the outset so you can actually design 51 versions of the voter guide? And is there a cost savings if you print less? And along that, uh, I've been looking at disclosure, but is there a way to ask questions in the voter guide that can show discrepancies between candidates in a system where all the candidates, if they know what they're doing, 
are going to have the exact same answers to every question they have in the past. <laughs> well, that's a, a, a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I, let me talk about the, the matching uh, funds uh, and the compliance work that we're doing uh, first. Um, you know, in the, in the Council District 45, uh, we paid six candidates. Two of them received the maximum, and two other candidates came quite close to receiving the maximum. And again, this is the enhanced maximum at 75% of the spending limit. Uh, so, you know, this is, uh, you know, it, it was, I think, uh, very successful, you know, those candidates in, re in uh, receiving the matching funds. So everyone knows the special elections are you know, harder, they're quicker, they're, you know, they, they were, they're, the time frames for responding to things are much more difficult. Um, there are a couple of things that are going to happen to help improve compliance. One is we are looking at our, oh, I'm sorry, is my time up? That, that's uh, on me, not oh, you. Oh, oh, that's not time, it's for you. Okay. <laughs> uh, the, uh, so we're looking at, you know, we're doing an internal review and uh, to make sure that the, our guidance is clear and that there, the questions we ask are and the, what we expect as responses are very clear to candidates. Um, one thing that the new schedule will do definitely is give more guidance to candidates earlier. When, with, with the February payment, uh, you know, now the first public funds payments are made five weeks before the election. With the advent of the February payment, the great advantage of that is candidates will ha know where they stand as far as compliance issues and will have more time at a less busy time in the election cycle to respond to those questions. So that should ease the burden for many candidates. It doesn't help in a special election, but it certainly help, will help in a, in a primary and general election situation. Um, the other question about the voter guide is that the, the voter guide for this year, the budget for next year doesn't include, it's a citywide voter guide, so it doesn't have any adjustment for what you're talking about. It's not going to be printed by district, it's a citywide guide, there's the same guide, it goes to everybody in the entire city. Um, we have looked at this uh, issue of printing, you know, one district per uh, guide, and it would significantly in increase the costs. Um, so, you know, we can continue looking at that and seeing ways to better do that. Um, but, you know, as, as far as, you know, the current technology and our current uh, research into that, it would be significantly more expensive to print a guide for each district. Um, and then as far as your final qu uh, question about uh, the questions, uh, one thing that we do have in our budget is a, a budget line to improve our Voter, voter guide submission application, so to make it more flexible and to allow for different kinds of questions and hopefully elicit different kinds of responses from candidates so that they can demonstrate their differences more clearly to the voters in their responses. I certainly can't guarantee that that's going to happen because people will be answering their own the questions. Um, and we'll be asking everyone the same questions because that's the only fair way to do it, but, uh, you know, what the responses are, hopefully this will be more flexible and allow people to have a more varied response. Okay, we were joined by Council Member Jonai. Uh, this is a very short hearing. Uh, we are going to end here then, and we thank you for coming in. Okay. And uh, oh. one question, uh -huh. yeah. Thank you. Um, what would the cost estimated for the matching funds with the increase um, now eight to one or is it 10 to one? Well, um, again, we, you know, we are trying, we're just starting to do the estimate models, you know, beginning the models for 2021. But when we testified before the Charter Revision Commission and talked about this potential change, we gave an estimate that uh, there would be about a 47% increase in public funds with in, it's the couple, the eight to one, the higher uh, matchable amount for citywide offices, um, and the higher total amount of public funds available to each candidate. What's that total? Um, what do you have seven percent on? Well, um, there's, we don't have an actual 
budget total because we don't, well, one, in this next fiscal year, we don't anticipate paying, uh, I mean, there may be a special election, but we won't pay paying on a citywide. Uh, we, our estimate is that it would be about a 47% increase. So in, so for example, in 2013, we paid $38 million in public funds. Um, and so it would be about a 47% increase from that. So, so it's another. You're looking 20. at roughly $60 million yeah. as an estimate. Uh, yeah, about, I mean, yes. But I, uh, that again is using the numbers from, from 2013. Uh, it's hard to model what will happen in 2021, what we, you know, what, how many more candidates there might be, uh, and how people will do their fundraising. But we'll, all we could do in our predictions is apply the new limits to the old data. What if you're grossly underestimating that number? Well, I'm envisioning people coming out of the woodworks now to take advantage of this matching fund uh, opportunity and to try to build a name for themselves and using taxpayer dollars so that they can benefit from it versus the intent? Well, when we prepare our budget estimate for the 2021 election, which will be next year, in next year's uh, fiscal year, um, we will be use, employing a modeling to look at what we know about the election at that time, how many open seats there are, um, because things will change between now. We anticipate that there'll be 42 open seats. There may be fewer open seats when we get uh, get closer to making that prediction. But again, we'll be working on a model. And we have, every time uh, we've uh, put money in for the public fund in, in our budget, we have always done it conservatively, you know, overestimated the amount that we might need, um, just to ensure that you don't come to the date of the election and there's no money, even though, even though the law provides for an emergency provision to transfer mo additional money if it's necessary. Uh, we hope never have, we hope not to use that <laughs> provision, but we've always somewhat overestimated and then immediately after the election returned any additional funds that we didn't need back to the city right after the election was over. I, I just expect a much larger use of matching funds um, for various reasons and I would caution that we should budget appropriately. Yeah. I, yeah, I imagine that you're correct and that is the intention to encourage more people to run and to get more small dollars into the election system. So. You know that, but we will certainly be cautious when we do our budget estimate next year. Thank you. Thank you. One thing else I'll, I'll say is I thought that the um, I guess you'd call them um, preliminary audits. Maybe uh, each period, you know, um, was very helpful to my campaign and I think other council members as well in terms of correcting any mistakes uh, before you actually, you know. Um, hit for it, you know, and so I think that was a good, a good thing to do this last election cycle. Yes, okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And again, as we, as it's earlier in the election, you know, as we make payment determinations earlier in the election, people will hopefully focus on those and, and respond to them as they go along. Good. All right, well, thank you very much, you. and uh, we appreciate you coming in. This uh, hearing is adjourned at 2.30 in the afternoon. Chair. All right, thank you. Congratulations. Good job.